Revelation chapters 10 to 13. Chapter 10. The beginning of the dispensation of the fullness of times, Ephesians 1 verse 10, is detailed in the first six verses of this chapter, as seen by the fact that the angel declares that there should be time no longer verse 6. This is done to show John that Israel's opportunity to be saved is almost over. This is also seen in verse 7, which says that the great tribulation period ends when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. Since the sixth angel just sounded in Revelation 9 verse 13, and the seventh angel will sound in Revelation 11 verse 15, there is not much time left for the lost sheep of Israel to hear and believe the gospel of the kingdom in order to be saved. Therefore, John needs to digest all the words of prophecy given to him, verses 8 to 10, and speak to them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Since Israel is scattered among the heathen, due to the fifth cycle of chastisement, this involves prophesying again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, verse 11. Revelation 10 verse 1, a rainbow represents the glory of the Lord, Ezekiel 1 verse 28. This is probably true because God's glory is seen in his mercy in not destroying the earth with a flood again. In other words, at the time of the tribulation period, the world is as bad as it was in the days of Noah, Matthew 24 verse 37. Yet, God cannot bring a flood, like he did then, because he would be breaking his promise. Therefore, his glory is seen in the rainbow as a reminder that God is destroying the earth with fire this time, which is glorious because fire is what keeps sin from reaching God's throne, which is why the people in hell burn with fire, not with water. Therefore, the fact that God will soon bring a judgment of fire upon the world indicates that, as will be seen in 10 colon 6, God's eternal kingdom, with sin completely cast out forever, is about to come to fruition, and the rainbow, upon this angel's head, is a reminder of this. His face being like the sun, and his feet being like pillars of fire remind us of the description of Jesus in Revelation 1 verses 15 to 16. The angel, here, then, is probably the Lord Jesus Christ, especially since the same angel gives power to the two witnesses in Revelation 11 verse 3. Jesus is probably seen as an angel, because angels are messengers of God, and this angel gives John a little book, which contains prophecies, Revelation 10 2, 10 11. Thus, Jesus acts as a messenger of God here. There have been television programs in the past where someone has a dream, and all of the people in the dream look like the person he is thinking about. The person is the waiter, the cook, the doorman, and everyone else. The book of Revelation is sort of like this. Because it is only the Lord Jesus Christ, who conquered death and hell, and is far above all of Satan's forces, Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 21, in the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ plays many of the main characters on God's side, because he is the only one qualified to do many of these things to bring about God's kingdom. Recognizing this also helps us keep in mind that, today, in the dispensation of grace, our salvation and sanctification are all about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, rather than how we can improve ourselves, because we cannot improve ourselves, Romans 7 verse 18. Revelation 10 verse 2, the little book, here, is later eaten by John so that he may prophesy, 10 colon 10 11. Chronologically speaking, this chapter occurs after the millennial reign, because 10 colon 6 tells us that it is the beginning of the dispensation of the fullness of times, Ephesians 1 verse 10, that is, when time ends. Therefore, we are transported way into the future now. This mighty angel, Revelation 10 verse 1, is huge, because he is able to put one foot on the sea, and the other foot on the earth, which is another reason to believe that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 10 verse 3, Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5 verse 5. He roars as a lion, here, because he is about to destroy the heaven and the earth and bring in the new heaven and the new earth. Thunder represents the voice of God, John 12 verses 28 to 29. Therefore, the seven thunders are the voice of God, speaking into existence the new heaven and the new earth. When God created the world, he spoke it into existence. Genesis 1 starts each day of creation with and God said, Genesis 1 colon 3, 6, 11, 14, 20, 24. Jesus Christ is the word of God, John 1 verses 1 and 14. Thus, God created the world by Jesus Christ. That is what Colossians 1 verses 15 to 17 specifically says. 
There were seven days of creation. There are also seven thunders here. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that there are seven thunders, one thunder for each day of the new creation. Revelation 10 verse 4, Everyone wants to know what the seven thunders said, because we are not told what they said. When God revealed end-time events to Daniel, he told him to shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end, Daniel 12 verse 4. It was not until the time of the end was at hand, Revelation 1 verse 3, that God allowed the end-time events to be revealed with the book of Revelation. Since the new heaven and the new earth, Revelation 21 verse 1, do not begin until after the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, the time of the new creation is not at hand at the writing of the book of Revelation. Therefore, like he did with Daniel, God tells John to seal up those things related to the new heaven and the new earth. Thus, what the seven thunders uttered was probably the voice of God speaking into existence the things of the new heaven and the new earth. Since they are not at that point yet, redeemed Israel would not be able to understand them at the time of John's writing of Revelation. However, the main reason that John cannot write down what the seven thunders said is probably because the mere writing down of the words would cause the new creation to begin at that point in time. In other words, since and God said, brought the old creation into existence, and God said, would also bring the new creation into existence. Thus, John hears the words because he is in the future, but the writing down of the words would bring them from the future and into the present. This is my guess as to why God tells John not to write down what the seven thunders said. The creation of the new heaven and the new earth is different from the creation in Genesis 1. For example, Revelation 21 verse 2 says that the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. The huge difference is in the quality of God's creation. With regard to the first creation, Genesis 1 verse 31 says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. With regard to the new creation, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Therefore, the first creation was exceptional, very good, while the new creation is superior, possessing qualities that bring great pleasure, beautiful. The reason for the difference is because the old creation had innocent men with dominion over the earth, but the new creation has redeemed men in Christ with dominion over the heaven and the earth. Therefore, the extent that the new creation is greater than the old creation is the extent to which Christ is more qualified to run God's universe than Adam was. I am sure there is a wide gap in knowledge between Adam and Christ. Talk about gap theory. This is it. Revelation 10 verses 5 to 6, So, once the seven thunders have spoken, the new heaven and the new earth are in existence. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, all devils, and all men, who did not have faith in God, are in the lake of fire. All that remains in heaven are the sinless spiritual creatures God made, and the body of Christ. All that remains on earth are the bride of Christ, Israel, and saved Gentiles from the prophecy dispensation. Since everyone left is holy, there is no need for time. The dispensation of the fullness of times begins, which is the beginning of eternity. Note how Revelation 10 verse 6 emphasizes creation, because it is, at this time, that God creates the new heaven and the new earth by the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, note how significant this event is. The Lord Jesus Christ lifted up his hand and swore by God that time is finished. Granted, God's word is always true, John 17 verse 17, but when he swears by himself that something is true, it is very important. God invented time over 6,000 years ago, and it will exist for more than 1,000 years from now. Time is an invention that has been around as long as the earth has. Therefore, the elimination of time is a huge event, just as huge as the discarding of the old heaven and old earth, because it signals the beginning of eternity. Revelation 10 verse 7, the fact that this verse starts with, but tells us that there is a change in time right now 10 colon 6 happens after the millennial reign, while 10 verse 7 happens in the Great Tribulation period. 10 verse 7 speaks of the seventh trumpet judgment. Contained within the seventh trumpet judgment are the seven vile judgments, which conclude the tribulation period. 10 verse 7 mentions the mystery of God being finished at the end of the tribulation period. This cannot be the mystery given to the Apostle Paul because, 1, 
Paul's mystery was kept secret until revealed to Paul Romans 16 verses 25 to 26, while the mystery of God was declared to God's servants the prophets 10 verse 7, which would be the prophets of Israel's program. Israel's prophets may have declared it, but it was still a mystery to them, because they inquired and searched diligently, searching what, or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. It was not revealed unto them, 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12, and 2, the mystery of God, is finished at the end of the tribulation period, while the mystery dispensation concludes before this at the rapture. The purpose of the tribulation period is to refine Israel, so that they may be pleasing to the Lord, Malachi 3 verses 3 to 4, such that all Israel is saved, Romans 11 verse 26. Since the mystery of God finishes at the end of the tribulation period, I believe this mystery refers to how God saves Israel and brings them into the promised land on earth to stay for all eternity, especially since the prophets all spoke of that future time. How does God take hardened, unbelieving Israel and refine them to be pure, holy, and pleasing in God's sight, when they were as Sodom and Gomorrah, Isaiah 1 verses 9 to 10, and became worse than the Canaanites, 1 Kings 14 verse 24, who God told Israel to utterly destroy, Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 to 2? That is the mystery of God 10 verse 7. Revelation 10 verse 8, the voice from heaven in 10 colon 4 and 8 would be the Lord. Thus we see Jesus the man in 10 verse 5 to 6, stopping time, and we see Jesus as God in 10 verse 4 and 8 commanding John. Revelation 10 verses 9 to 11, John is very brave to go up to the angel. I know that Jesus told him to do so. Still, this mighty angel just spoke like a lion, 10 verse 3, stood upon the sea and the earth at the same time, 10 verse 5, and ended time, 10 verse 6. I would have been too scared to go up to that angel and command him to, give me the little book. In Ezekiel 2 colon 8 3 colon 3, God has Ezekiel eat a roll of a book that contains lamentations and mourning, and woe Ezekiel 2 verse 10, because that is what Ezekiel must speak to Israel. The book was in his mouth, as honey for sweetness, 3 verse 3. Both Psalm 19 verse 10, and 119 colon 103 say that God's words are sweet. Therefore, when John eats the little book of God's words, it is sweet as honey in his mouth. In Revelation 10 verse 11 says that John must prophesy again, which means the reason he eats the little book is so he will have God's words to prophesy in the future. He must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, 10 verse 11. Now, this probably refers to the little flock being arrested during the Great Tribulation and having to speak the truth to those trying them, which would be the people, nations, tongues, and kings of 10 11. Jesus told his disciples that, at that time, the Holy Ghost will give them the words to say, Mark 13 verse 11. The belly, here in 10 10, probably represents the flesh. Since the flesh is contrary to the things of the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17, God's word is bitter to the flesh. Thus the mouth, being used by the Holy Ghost, says God's words are sweet, while the flesh, being contrary to the Spirit, finds God's words to be bitter. So basically, the little book represents the words of God that the Holy Ghost will say through the little flock during the Great Tribulation period so that all Israel might be saved, finishing the mystery of God. Note that these prophetic words are said before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings 10 11. The words are not directed to them. Rather they are directed to Israel, so that they may be saved, because the Gentiles will not repent of their evil 9.20-21. These words must be spoken before all nations because Israel will be scattered among the nations, as punishment from God for their disobedience of God's law covenant with them Leviticus 26 verse 33. In fact, John 7 verse 35 shows that some Jews were already dispersed among the Gentiles at that time. Therefore, John is not giving a salvation message for the world. Rather, the message is for Israel so that they may be saved, Romans 11 verse 26. Then, in the millennial reign, Israel will go to the Gentiles as a kingdom of priests, so that the Gentiles may be saved. Chapter 11 At the beginning of the tribulation period, God will send his two witnesses, verse 3. They will stand before God and in front of the temple for three and a half years, verses 3 to 4. They warn Israel of impending judgment. 
The Antichrist hates them, because they keep him from getting into the temple to show the world that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Therefore, when their three and a half years are up, the Antichrist kills them, verse 7. The world hates the two witnesses, also, since they warn the world that they will die if they do not have faith in God. Therefore, the world greatly rejoices over the death of the two witnesses, as well, verses 9 to 10. However, God shows the world that the two witnesses are of God, by raising them from the dead, and having them ascend up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watch, verses 11 to 12. God also destroys 10% of Babylon with an earthquake, verse 13. Thus, the two witnesses are witnesses to who are the believers and who are the unbelievers, giving God the evidence, he needs to come and judge the world, as seen in verses 15 to 19 in the seventh trumpet judgment. Revelation 11 verse 1, in Ezekiel 40 to 42, the temple and everything around it is measured and the dimensions are written down. Then, in Ezekiel 43 verses 2 to 6, the glory of the Lord fills the temple. Then, in Ezekiel 43 verse 7, God says that the house of Israel will northwest more defile the place where he sits on his throne. The true temple of God and the place of his throne are in New Jerusalem right now. It will come down to earth from God out of heaven after Satan, and his forces are destroyed after the end of the millennial reign, Revelation 21 verses 1 to 2 which is the time of the events in chapter 10. Therefore, when John is told to measure the temple of God in Revelation 11 verse 1, he is measuring the temple in the new Jerusalem on earth in the future. The point is to show John that the temple has the exact same measurements as it did in Ezekiel 40 to 42, proving that this is the temple of God, not of Satan, and that God preserved his temple without defilement unto his eternal kingdom on earth, as he promised in Ezekiel 43 verse 7 that he would do. Revelation 11 verse 2, 42 months is three and a half years. This coincides with the Great Tribulation period. Matthew 24 verse 15 says that the abomination of desolation will stand in the holy place. That would defile the place in which it stands. However, this is not the temple of God, because the temple of God remains holy. Rather, it is the temple on earth during the Great Tribulation period that the Antichrist has built. Note, from Daniel 9 verse 26, that the Antichrist destroys the sanctuary, which means that he had to rebuild the sanctuary for the time of his rule. Therefore, the one that he sits in, halfway through the tribulation period, is the one that he had built. Since the Antichrist is not part of the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, due to his unbelief, he is considered by God to be a Gentile. Further, Revelation 13 verse 5 says that the Antichrist has power, to continue 40 and 2 months, which would be the same 42-month period of Revelation 11 verse 2. The court which is without the temple, Revelation 11 verse 2, was the place for the Gentiles to worship God. Being an unbeliever, this court is given to the Antichrist to trod underfoot, along with Jerusalem, for three and a half years. The court which is without the temple, then, is the temple that the Antichrist will build to mimic the temple of God in heaven. Thus, it will have a holy place, and it is in that temple that the abomination of desolation is set up. From there the Antichrist and apostate Israel will tread the holy city, under foot 40 and 2 months, Revelation 11 verse 2. This must refer to the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, since Luke 21 verse 24 says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which would be at the end of the tribulation period, according to Daniel 2 verse 44. Note also, here in 11 colon 2, that the Lord calls the Antichrist and his forces Gentiles. They are physical Jews, Daniel 11 verse 37, but they are not part of God's Israel because of their unbelief. This is how God can say that all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11 verse 26, even though many physical Jews will have their place in the lake of fire. The purpose of Revelation 11 verses 1 to 2, then, is to show Israel that the temple, that the Antichrist says is God's temple, is not really God's temple, because it does not match the measurements found in Ezekiel 40 to 42. The believing remnant will compare the measurements with those in Ezekiel 40 to 42 to prove that the Antichrist's temple is not God's temple. Therefore, the evidence will tell them that the Antichrist is not Israel's Messiah. In fact, God says that the Antichrist is a spiritual Gentile. 
The things that the Antichrist does during the Great Tribulation are not by the power of God. Rather, it is God, allowing the court outside the temple and the holy city to be defiled by the Antichrist and apostate Israel. Therefore, when the Antichrist, as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, he is really a false god in a false temple, since the true temple of God is in New Jerusalem, which is in heaven at the time. Revelation 11 verses 3 to 13, explains how the Antichrist and apostate Israel are able to take over the temple and the holy city for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. We see that they are not able to take over during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, because God gives power unto his two witnesses during that time, Revelation 11 verse 3, and anyone coming against the two witnesses during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period will be killed, Revelation 11 verse 5. The 1260 days in Revelation 11 verse 3 correspond to the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Years last 360 days in the Bible. You see, the tribulation period is God's refining fire so that all Israel may be saved and enter into God's eternal kingdom on earth. The tribulation period begins a short while after the rapture of the church. All saved people go to heaven at the rapture, leaving the world with nothing but unbelievers. Therefore, God sends two witnesses to prophesy of what will happen so that Israel may believe the gospel of the kingdom before the Antichrist takes over Jerusalem. Thus, the two witnesses prophesy in front of the temple for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. They do so in sackcloth to show it is a time of mourning, due to Israel's last state, and their alliance with the devil via the seven-year contract they make with the Antichrist to begin the tribulation period. Who are the two witnesses of Revelation 11? When a Bible study is done on the two witnesses, invariably the majority of the time is spent on identifying who they are. This is sad because, since naming them was not a concern of God's, it should not be a concern of ours either. The important points to learn are that, 1. They will prophesy for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, 2. Their focus will be on God's impending judgment and the need for Israel to repent and serve God before it's too late, i.e., before the abomination of desolation is set up, and 3. Their untouchableness in the three and a half years and later resurrection show God's supreme power over Satan. If you learn these three points, you are far ahead of most Christians, who like to spend their time on the unprofitable exercise of naming names. Nevertheless, so much time and effort are spent on identifying these two, mysterious people that, for the sake of moving on, a discussion of who they are is provided here. Enoch and Elijah Some people claim that the two witnesses will be Enoch and Elijah. Enoch never died, Genesis 5 verse 24, and neither did Elijah, 2 Kings 2 verse 11. They are the only two humans, who we know of who never died. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The theory goes, then, that the two witnesses must be Enoch and Elijah, as they are the only ones who have not died, and all men have to die once. Therefore, Enoch and Elijah will be the two witnesses so that they can be killed by the beast, and Hebrews 9 verse 27 can be fulfilled. However, the context of Hebrews 9 verse 27 is that Christ had to die spiritually for sins in heaven itself, Hebrews 9 verses 24 to 25. This is in contrast to the animals that had to be sacrificed every year by the high priest to cover the sins of the people, Hebrews 9 verse 25. As man only dies once spiritually, so Christ only died once for the sins of the world, Hebrews 9 verse 28. The writer of Hebrews merely gives us Hebrews 9 verse 27 as part of his argument that Christ did not have to die multiple times, and the context shows that the death was a spiritual one, not a physical one. However, for the sake of argument, let's say that this applies to a physical death. Since the author of Hebrews uses it to say that Christ did not have to die multiple times, over and over again as the animals did, to atone for the sins of all of mankind, the context of the verse tells us that this rule is to be applied for dying not more than once, not at least once. In other words, for this rule to apply physically, no one could die, be resurrected from the dead, and die a second time, because Christ did not have to die more than once to atone for the sins of the world. In this case, we would have no resurrections from the dead without an ascension afterward. 
Yet, we see the widow's son raised from the dead through Elijah, 1 Kings 17 verses 22 to 23, a son being raised from the dead through Elisha, 2 Kings 4 verses 32 to 35, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, John 11 verses 43 to 44, many saints were resurrected when Jesus died, Matthew 27 verses 52 to 53, and there were others raised from the dead as well. Since no other ascensions are mentioned in the Bible, we can assume that all of these people, who were resurrected, eventually died again, meaning that they all died twice. If Elijah and Enoch must be the two witnesses to fulfill Hebrews 9 verse 27, all of the people mentioned, who have been resurrected, must also undie once for this verse to be fulfilled. Of course, it is silly to think that hundreds of people will undie. In fact, I do not even know what that means, let alone how it could happen. But this proves the fact that Hebrews 9 verse 27 is not talking about a physical death. Therefore, Hebrews 9 verse 27 cannot be used as justification that Enoch and Elijah will be the two witnesses of Revelation 11. b. Elijah and Moses Some people say that the two witnesses will be Elijah and Moses because they are the ones who came down to earth to meet Jesus at his transfiguration, Matthew 17 verses 1 to 4, and they did the things that the two witnesses will do, Revelation 11 verses 5 to 6, example, smite the earth with plagues, as Moses did and kill people with fire and stop rain from coming on the earth, as Elijah did. Under the Old Covenant, two witnesses were required to establish a matter as fact, Deuteronomy 19 verse 15. Therefore, God sent Elijah and Moses to establish that the transfiguration of Jesus was from God. It is entirely possible that Elijah and Moses will be the two witnesses in Revelation 11, but it is also entirely possible that God would send other saints of old or raise up new saints to be his two witnesses in Revelation 11. Just because Elijah and Moses served as God's two witnesses for Jesus' transfiguration does not mean they will serve as God's witnesses on earth for the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. Also, just because they did some of the things that the two witnesses did does not mean that other saints could not do the same things. C. Zerubbabel and Joshua If two people were to come back from the dead to be God's two witnesses in Revelation 11, based on God's word alone, those two people would probably be Zerubbabel and Joshua. This is so because God declares that they are the two olive branches, and they are the two anointed ones, that stand by the Lord of the whole earth, Zechariah 4 verses 12 to 14. Similarly, the two witnesses of Revelation 11 are the two olive trees, standing before the God of the earth, Revelation 11 verse 4. Therefore, going strictly by what the Bible says, if the two witnesses are resurrected saints, God's description of Zerubbabel and Joshua seem to fit the two witnesses the best. Yet, this theory is not as popular as the first two mentioned here, because they are not big heroes of the Bible like Enoch, Elijah, and Moses are. In fact, I have never heard anyone suggest that the two witnesses are Zerubbabel and Joshua, probably because churchianity does not like their stories, like they do with other Bible characters' stories. To be certain, they were important people in Israel's history, for they were called by God to help in the restoration of the temple after Babylonian captivity. However, we do not talk about them in children's Bible stories, because they emerged in the dark days of Israel, and did their comparatively boring jobs in the temple, as opposed to the exciting miracles that God did through Moses and Elijah. Since they are in the crispy section of your Bible, Hosea Malachi, the option of Zerubbabel and Joshua being the two witnesses, is not considered, even though they are the most plausible option of those mentioned in the Bible. D. Elijah and John the Baptist So much time has been spent trying to identify who these two witnesses are, but their names should be of no importance, because God does not give them to us. The funny thing is that, even if God did give us their names, it does not mean those would be the two witnesses. If Revelation 11 verse 3 said, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, it does not mean Elijah and Moses would be God's two witnesses. Here's why. Malachi for verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This may seem to be a clear indication that Elijah will be one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. The Jews took it that way. That is why Jesus' disciples asked Jesus why Elijah must first come, Matthew 17 verse 10. Jesus explained to them that Elias is come already, 
and they knew him not, Matthew 17 verse 12. Jesus was referring to John the Baptist, Matthew 17 verse 13. Therefore, even though in Malachi 4 verse 5, Elijah is specifically named as coming, Jesus explains that John the Baptist could fulfill this prophecy. God is a spirit, and his word is spiritual. Mun looks at Malachi for colon 5's reference to Elijah, and assumes that the Mun, Elijah, had to come back to earth. Jesus explained that it was the spirit of Elijah, and not the Mun, Elijah, that had to come back, and John the Baptist fulfilled Malachi for verse 5 by coming in the spirit of Elijah. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, Matthew 11 verses 14 to 15. Therefore, if God named Elijah and Moses as his two witnesses in Revelation 11, Bible teachers all over the world today would tell everyone that Elijah and Moses are definitely God's two witnesses, when it is more likely that God would be referring to the spirits of Elijah and Moses embodied in two completely new Jews who have never been to earth before. Therefore, named or not named, we have no idea what the earthly names of the two witnesses in Revelation 11 will be. E. Jup and Senan. So I have eliminated all of the theorized names of the two witnesses, and I have shown how that, even if they were specifically named in Revelation 11, we still could not rely on those to be the saints of old come back from the dead. Having done this, I now propose my own theory of Jup and Senan being the two witnesses. So you have never heard of Jup and Senan in the Bible. Their detailed stories are in the book of Hezekiah. I am kidding. There is no book of Hezekiah in the Bible. Jup and Senan are not mentioned in the Bible. Rather, they are common Jewish names today. My point is that I believe that, just as God raised up new, Jewish servants of God throughout the Bible, so God's two witnesses will be two, new Jews who have never lived before. They will be two completely new people, who will be his witnesses during the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. Living on earth is a great trial for the saints of God. God took Enoch and Elijah home to be with him before they died because they were servants of the Lord, who suffered greatly at the hands of sinful men. God said, Enough. They are too good for the world to have. I am getting them out of there. When Samuel was summoned by a witch in 1 Samuel 28 verse 15, the first thing Samuel said was, Why hast thou disquieted me, to bring me up? Samuel had had enough of the evil and wickedness of this world. He did not ever want to come back to the world with sin and Satan ruling. In fact, Hebrews 11 verses 36 to 38, speaking of the great people of faith says that, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. God's view of his saints is that they have suffered greatly at the hands of men. They should have been treated as kings, but they were treated like dirt. Therefore, the world was not worthy of them. Why, then, would God cause two of his most prominent servants to go through three, and a half years of more suffering after having experienced the joys of heaven for three thousand plus years. God loves them too much to do that. I doubt he will now say to them, Sorry, guys. Go back down to earth and suffer for three and a half more years, and then I will let you re-enter my joys for good after that. I promise. They have suffered enough and have received their reward. God is not going to take their reward away from them now. Instead, God will raise up two, new men, who will come in the spirit of these great, Jewish men of God, who will be his two witnesses in Revelation 11. At least, that is my opinion on the matter. Revelation 11 verse 4, the olive tree in the Bible is the tree of life. Olive oil represents the Holy Ghost in the Bible, Israel had to use olive oil in the lamp in the temple that never went out, Leviticus 24 verse 2. This is why God's Spirit was poured upon Israel, Acts 2 verses 17 to 18. Dot. As such, the olive tree represents the spiritual life of the nation of Israel. John 1 verses 5 and 9 says that, when Jesus came the first time, he was the true light, shining in the midst of darkness. Matthew 4 verse 16 says, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. The two witnesses are not the light, Jesus is. 
However, they bear witness of the light, which makes them the two candlesticks. Therefore, in the midst of all of the darkness of unbelief in Israel in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, stand God's two witnesses, offering eternal life and light on the scriptures for all Israel, who will come to the temple and believe the gospel of the kingdom, putting themselves back under God's law covenant with Israel. The two witnesses are also seen, standing before the God of the earth, Revelation 11 verse 4. Therefore they are also in Jerusalem for the same purpose that the two angels came to Sodom in Genesis 19. That is, they are there to spy out the land, which is spiritual Sodom, Isaiah 1 verse 10. Then, they will report back to God, the judge of the earth, standing before the judge, giving evidence of why God should destroy the earth with fire, just like he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire, due to their wickedness. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7. When the men in Sodom attacked the two angels, the men were blinded, Genesis 19 verses 9 to 11. Similarly, men will attack the two witnesses, and will be killed in the same manner that they tried to hurt the two witnesses, Revelation 11 verse 5. In Zechariah 4, Joshua and Zerubbabel are types of the two witnesses, as they are called the two, olive trees, Zechariah 4 verse 11, standing by the Lord of the whole earth, Zechariah 4 verse 14. There we are told that God's temple will be built not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, set the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4 verse 6. Thus, Israel should learn from the two witnesses that it is not the might or power of the Antichrist in taking over the world that is going to give Israel the kingdom. Rather, God's Spirit must be with Israel, and His Spirit is only with them if they have faith in God's law covenant with them. A type of this might versus spirit battle is seen in Numbers 13-14. to There God promises to give Israel the land of Canaan, Numbers 13-2. However, Israel is in unbelief, Numbers 14, 1-4. Therefore, God will not give them the land, Numbers 14, 23-24. Israel then decides that they will take the land by force, and they are killed as a result, Numbers 14, 44-45. Similarly, God said he would give Israel the promised land through the sacrifice of Jesus. Israel is in unbelief, therefore, they do not get the land yet but they try to take it by force by uniting themselves with the Antichrist. These people are then killed in the sixth trumpet judgment, Revelation 9 verses 14 to 19, and only the believing remnant of Israel will inherit the land, because they receive it by God's Spirit, rather than by power or might. Special note, the two witnesses stand in front of the temple and keep the Antichrist from going into the temple and taking it over. God's dwelling place is his temple. The devil's goal is to be God, Isaiah 14 verses 13 to 14, therefore, he wants to get into that temple at all costs. But the time for such blasphemy to take place is not until the last half of the tribulation period. Therefore, the two witnesses stand before the God of the earth, Revelation 11 verse 4, preventing this from happening during the first half of the tribulation period. Then, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast kills them, Revelation 11 verse 7, and the devil gets to pretend like he is God for three and a half years. Revelation 11 verse 5, the sign that Israel must have faith in God to receive the promised land, rather than being able to take it by might or power themselves, is seen in the fact that those who come up against God's two witnesses will be killed. Thus, Israel has a graphic visual to tell them that, unless they believe God's law covenant with them and trust in God to bring them into the kingdom, they will burn forever in the lake of fire. A type of the two witnesses consuming their enemies by fire is seen in Elijah's day in 2 Kings 1 verses 10 and 12. There Elijah gives the word of the Lord to the king that he will die. The king sends men against Elijah, and those men are killed by fire. Similarly, the Antichrist will send men against the two witnesses, and those men will be killed by fire. Revelation 11 verse 6, also, in Elijah's day, Elijah stopped it from reigning for three, and a half years, James 5 verse 17. Similarly, the two witnesses will keep it from reigning for the three, and a half years of their prophesying. Rain represents life. Without rain, food does not grow. No rain equals no life. Therefore, no rain, during the first half of the tribulation period, 
is a sign to Israel that they have signed a covenant of death with the Antichrist. Of the waters that do exist upon the earth, the two witnesses have the power to turn them to blood, Revelation 11 verse 6. This is a sign of the judgment of God that those partaking of the water or religion of the Antichrist will be destroyed by God, while those who have asked Jesus for living water, John 4 verse 10, will have abundant life, John 10 verse 10, in God's eternal kingdom on earth. There are parallels to be drawn between Israel under Pharaoh and Israel under the Antichrist. Under Pharaoh, Israel was serving the devil, and God brought about plagues to show Israel that God was not on Pharaoh's side, so that Israel would leave Egypt and enter the promised land. The tribulation period starts with Israel making a covenant with the Antichrist, Daniel 9 verse 27. The two witnesses, however, just like Moses and Aaron, represent God and stand against the Antichrist. The plea they will make to him is that God says, Let my people go. They will smite the earth with plagues, just like God did to Pharaoh, in order to get Israel loose from the hands of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a man, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, and a beast during the last three and a half years. The two witnesses will smite the Antichrist and apostate Israel with plagues, while the 144,000 believing Israel of God, chapter 7, are not hurt by the plagues. Eventually, the Antichrist will try to kill the two witnesses in the head with a sword. We know this because the beast, which Satan resurrects from the dead, Revelation 13 verses 1 to 2, has a head, as it were wounded to death, Revelation 13 verse 3, and this his wound came by a sword, Revelation 13 verse 14. Revelation 11 verse 5 says, regarding the two witnesses, if any man hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Therefore, we can conclude that the Antichrist, the man, tried to kill the two witnesses in the head, and the two witnesses then killed the Antichrist in the head. This ends up being how the Antichrist lets God's people go, so that God can seal them as his people before the Great Tribulation period starts, Chapter 7. The rest of the Jews, however, are in apostasy. The sealed 144,000 are safe from the beast during the Great Tribulation, Revelation 12 verse 14, while the rest of the Jews are still in bondage, under the covenant they made with the Antichrist, due to their unbelief, much like Israel had to believe God's word to them after they crossed the Red Sea, or else they would not be saved. Revelation 11 verse 7, 11 colon 5 says that no man can kill the two witnesses. Therefore, when the Antichrist is killed by the two witnesses, halfway through the tribulation period, Satan resurrects the Antichrist in the body of a beast, rather than a man, Revelation 13 verses 1 to 2. Satan will think that no one can stop the beast, since he makes war with the two witnesses and kills them. However, the real reason the Antichrist is able to kill the two witnesses is not because he is a beast, but because they shall have finished their testimony, Revelation 11 verse 7. They have the power to prophesy to Israel for 1,260 days, or the first three, and a half years of the tribulation period, Revelation 11 verse 3. We know that the two witnesses prophesy for the first half of the tribulation period, because the beast kills them once he rises from the dead, and then he rules the world for 42 months. This is the time God gives Israel to believe, and be sealed to go through the great tribulation period and scathed by Satan. Once this time is up, it is time for the Antichrist, in beast mode, to begin the great tribulation period. Therefore, the two witnesses are killed to make way for the Antichrist to come into the temple and desecrate it by proclaiming himself to be God, and having all people bow down to his image. By killing the two witnesses, the devil will think he has finally overpowered God. However, the real reason God allows them to be killed is because they have finished their testimony, Revelation 11 verse 7. Revelation 11 verse 8, the great city, is Jerusalem, as that is where the temple is. However, this is not the Jerusalem of God, due to the apostasy of Israel. Therefore, it spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt 11 colon 8. God also calls Jerusalem, Sodom, in Isaiah 1 verse 10. God wants to leave no ambiguity that the Antichrist's kingdom in Jerusalem is not of God. When God called Jerusalem, Sodom, in Isaiah 1 verse 10, it was because they had turned God's religion, under the old covenant God made with them, into their own religion so that they could do all of the evil they wanted to do, and still absolve their guilt by practicing their religion. Egypt is known for Baal worship. 
therefore calling Jerusalem, Egypt, shows that the religious system of the Antichrist, that will be present in Jerusalem during the tribulation period, is a false religious system that incorporates elements from both God's religion of Judaism and Satan's religion of Baal worship, which shows that Jerusalem is spiritually dead during the tribulation period. It was in this same condition at Jesus' first coming, and the result was that the Lord was crucified, Revelation 11 verse 8. This fact is probably inserted to let Israel see that they should not trust in what happens in Jerusalem, because it will lead to their eternal damnation, just like Jerusalem's forefathers will be eternally damned for crucifying their Messiah, Matthew 23 verse 33, 27 colon 25. Revelation 11 verses 9 to 10, these verses show the utter depravity of men. For three and a half years, the two witnesses stood for God. Because the people of the earth are wicked and refuse to have faith in what God told them through the two witnesses, they had been trying to kill these witnesses the whole time, but were unsuccessful. Therefore they are so happy, when the two witnesses are killed by the beast, that they declare it a world holiday, sending each other gifts in celebration. So evil is the world that people flock to see the two witnesses' dead bodies and rejoice over their dead carcasses, lying in open view. This is a lack of shamefacedness over sin. Rather, much like Sodom did, they boast in their wickedness. Also, note from Revelation 11 verse 9 that this verse deals with physical Jews. They are the ones of people and kindreds and tongues and nations, who have come to Jerusalem to unite behind their Messiah, the Antichrist. They keep careful guard of the bodies to make sure they stay out in the open for all to see as so-called proof that God is not with the two witnesses. However, in doing so, they provide proof to the whole world that God is in the two witnesses, as all are able to see their resurrection and ascension into heaven. Then, in Revelation 11 verse 10, we see the reaction of the Gentiles in the whole world that they are also glad that the two witnesses have been killed by the beast. Leave it up to pagan Gentiles to celebrate the day by sending gifts one to another, just like they do today at Christmas. Revelation 11 verses 11 to 12, the death of the two witnesses symbolizes the spiritual deadness of the world, while their resurrection shows that life is still possible for those who believe God. The three and a half days they are dead representing the three, and a half years that Israel still has remaining to have faith in God so that they also may be resurrected from the dead at Jesus' second coming. The resurrection of the two witnesses tells apostate Israel a couple of things. 1. Just a few days prior, Satan resurrected the Antichrist from the dead and claimed that he must be the Christ, due to his death, burial and resurrection. The resurrection of the two witnesses shows that God was in the two witnesses all along and not in the Antichrist. This is proven by the command from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, Revelation 11 verse 12. In other words, the voice from heaven proves that God is still in control, and two, this resurrection of the two witnesses in plain sight of their enemies gives the whole world the evidence that they did rise from the dead. After all, with today's technology, there must have been a live webcam recording the event, given how joyful the whole earth is over their dead bodies. Therefore, no excuse can be made up, such as the excuse of, his disciples came by night and stole him away, Matthew 28 verse 13, that the Pharisees came up with regarding Jesus' death. No. The power of God rose the two witnesses from the dead. Therefore, God has the power over death. Israel does well to take note and believe the gospel. It is also significant that the two witnesses ascended up to heaven in a cloud, Revelation 11 verse 12. When Jesus ascended to heaven, a cloud also received him, Acts 1 verse 9. When the body of Christ was raptured up, they met the Lord in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he will also come in the clouds of heaven, Matthew 24 verse 30. Therefore, ascending up to heaven in a cloud is yet another proof that the two witnesses are of God. Revelation 11 verse 13, of course, the Antichrist will spin the two witnesses' resurrection and ascension to say that the devil did that, just like he would have already said about the rapture of the body of Christ. Therefore, to remove all doubt, God follows the ascension with a great earthquake, such that 10% of the city and 7,000 men are destroyed. This is a sign of what will happen to end the tribulation period, as the whole city of Babylon, i.e., Jerusalem, will fall at that time, 18,2, via the greatest earthquake of all time, Revelation 16 verses 17 to 21. 
Note that the remaining people in the city gave glory to the God of heaven, Revelation 11 verse 13. Therefore, although the Antichrist will twist what happens so that he can continue Satan's lie program for another three and a half years, people will know that God was behind the two witnesses all along. Therefore, the truth is there for those who want to believe it. The problem is that most will want to believe Satan's lies so that they can keep satisfying the lusts of their flesh. This is much like people today in Christian churches who believe the lies taught to them in their churches, instead of believing the truth of God's word rightly divided. Incidentally, a similar thing happened at Jesus' crucifixion, i.e., there was an earthquake, and a Gentile confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, Matthew 27 verses 51 and 54. Also, note that, for the first time in Revelation, God is called, the God of Heaven, Revelation 11 verse 13. That is because by this time, Michael and his angels have already cast the devil and his angels down to the earth, 12 colon 7 dash 8, filling the devil's heavenly positions with the body of Christ, Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 23. Therefore, God has already established himself as the God of heaven, and it will be just three and a half more years before God establishes himself as the God of the earth as well. Revelation 11 verse 14, the sixth trumpet judgment started in 913 and ends here. It includes one third of mankind being killed, Revelation 9 verses 14 to 21, time ending after Jesus' millennial reign, Revelation 10 verse 6 and the events surrounding the two witnesses during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, Revelation 11 verses 1 to 13. Therefore, we can see that events in Revelation are not necessarily presented in chronological order. Rather, they are presented in God's order to show Israel their guilt before God and their need to put themselves back under God's law covenant with them in order to enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. Revelation 11 verse 15, the seventh trumpet judgment is the last one. Contained within it are the seven, vile judgments. So, we will see more tribulations on the earth. However, because it is the last trumpet, those in heaven see it as the time when God overthrows Satan's kingdom, and God rules and reigns forever on the earth. Thus, we see the God of heaven in Revelation 11 verse 13, and the God of the earth in Revelation 11 verse 15. We also see both the deity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ in this verse. His deity is seen in that the kingdoms belong to our Lord. His humanity is seen in that they belong to his Christ. This is one and the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Both his deity and his humanity are mentioned because he would not have the power to overthrow Satan's kingdom if he were not both fully God and fully man. This power comes from his death, burial, and resurrection, winning the victory over sin and death, Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23 and 1 Corinthians 15 verses 54 to 57. Only his victory over death can bring about eternity for God's people. When Jesus was on the earth the first time, Satan tempted him by showing unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine, Luke 4 verses 5 to 7. Instead, Jesus worshiped the Lord God only, Luke 4 verse 8. Now, with the seventh trumpet judgment, the result is that, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Therefore, by trusting God, the Lord Jesus Christ received all the kingdoms of the world from God. And because he received them from God, he shall reign forever and ever, Revelation 11 verse 15. Thus, Jesus made the wise choice, which is good for Israel. Because they are in Christ, they shall reign with Christ forever and ever. Revelation 22 verse 5. Revelation 11 verse 16. Whenever the 24 elders are mentioned, we always see them worshiping God. As such, they are the worship leaders in heaven. We previously mentioned that these are the 12 apostles plus 12 saved men from the mystery dispensation. Thus, they are men. Ezekiel 28 verses 13 to 14 shows that Lucifer was the worship leader of heaven. Then, iniquity was found in him, he became Satan, and he will be cast out, Ezekiel 28 verses 15 to 16. This was not poor planning by God. He knew Lucifer would fall. 
He also knew that the best worship leaders are those who have the most to worship God for. As Luke 7 verse 47 says, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Redeemed men, then, make better worshippers of God than angels do. The twenty-four elders know sound doctrine about God more than other men. Therefore, they make for the perfect worship leaders. Therefore, from the vantage point of eternity, we can say that knowing that Lucifer would fall, God made him worship leader in heaven, since that position would later be better filled with more qualified personnel, i.e., redeemed men. Because of the sound doctrine and the charity of God in the inner men of the twenty-four elders, that was built up through the trials they went through on earth, the twenty-four elders will not have pride and fall like Lucifer did. Thus, they are the eternal worship leaders of God, twelve in heaven as part of the body of Christ, and twelve on earth, the twelve apostles, as part of the prophecy dispensation. Revelation 11 verse 17, Acts 2 verse 36 says that Jesus was made Lord by God the Father, due to his work on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 54 to 57 says that Jesus won the victory over death and the grave through the cross. This makes him, Lord God Almighty, Revelation 11 verse 17, whom the twenty-four elders worship. The twenty-four elders recognize him in the present, past, and future. In the present, i.e., during the seven trumpet judgment, he shows himself as Lord God Almighty through the tribulations he brings upon Israel so that they might be saved, this is no small task, as chapter 5 showed us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one powerful enough to do this. In the past, he showed himself to be Lord God Almighty through his victory over death, sin, and the grave, through his death, burial, and resurrection. In the future, he will show himself to be Lord God Almighty when he overthrows Satan's kingdom and sets up his eternal kingdom on earth. Since this involves giving eternal life to redeemed men, the twenty-four elders, give thee thanks, Revelation 11 verse 17. Being God, God has always had the power over Satan and his kingdom, but it is only at certain times that God takes to himself his great power and reigns so as to redeem all men, who are willing to be redeemed. Jesus told the Father just before his crucifixion, Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, John 17 verse 12. So too, we can be assured that God waits for all of the lost sheep of Israel, Romans 11 verse 26, to manifest faith in God before he takes unto himself his great power and overthrows Satan's kingdom, setting up God's eternal kingdom on earth. Unbelieving men says, if there is a God, why doesn't he put away evil? The answer is, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 verse 9. In other words, because God is loving, he suffers long with the evil of men so that more people may be saved. Therefore, God's patience speaks of his love, not of his non-existence. Revelation 11 verse 18, Romans 11 verse 26 says that all Israel shall be saved. The Gentile nations, on the other hand, remain apostate in the tribulation period, for the most part. When Babylon is fallen at the end of the tribulation period, their wealth is gone. Therefore, the nations were angry, Revelation 11 verse 18. They sold their souls to the devil for material prosperity in the Antichrist's kingdom, and all of that is gone. You can see why they are angry now. Note that the events of the seventh trumpet judgment extend all the way past the millennial reign. Also, since the elders are now in heaven, outside of time, the events they mention are not given in chronological order. Thy wrath is come, Revelation 11 verse 18, would be a reference to Jesus' overthrow of Babylon, and the nations at his second coming. The time of the dead, that they should be judged, Revelation 11 verse 18, refers to the great white throne judgment after the millennial reign, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Note how the dead are those without faith in whatever God told them. 20 colon 12 dash 14 specifically says, the dead stand before God, the dead were judged, and death was cast into the lake of fire. Those who have faith in what God has told them, have eternal life as a present possession. Therefore, they are not considered to be dead. For example, those in the grave, raptured up at the end of the mystery dispensation, are not dead. Rather, they sleep in Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 14. 
therefore the time of the dead's judgment is after the millennial reign. The next event, mentioned in 1118, happens 1,000 years prior, at Jesus' second coming. This is the reward to the prophets and the saints. The prophets get a higher reward for their service to God during the prophecy dispensation because they got God's word out to Israel. Then, the saints are believers in Israel, who believe that God would redeem Israel via the law covenant. Them that fear thy name would be the Gentiles, who blessed Israel, because of their faith in God's covenantal promise to Israel Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. They are judged separately, as Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 mentions. Gentiles, who blessed Israel, go into the kingdom, while Gentiles, who cursed Israel, go into everlasting fire. I believe this event takes place after the millennial reign is over, because the Gentiles in Israel's program will not make their final decision, regarding whose side they are on, until then. Then, the destruction of those, which destroy the earth, is God's wrath poured out on the Antichrist, and all those following him, at Jesus' second coming. This verse, then, testifies to the great power, of the Lord God Almighty, Revelation 11 verse 17, in that he causes all of these great events to come to pass. These events happen years apart, but being outside of time, the elders see them happening together. This is not unlike the prophecy of the Messiah, found in Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 3. Jesus read this passage but stopped reading after, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, Luke 4 verses 17 to 21. The rest of the passage would be fulfilled at Jesus' second coming. In other words, Isaiah wrote it all down as one sentence, but Jesus fulfilled the first part 2,000 years ago, and will fulfill the second part later. So, too, Revelation 11 verse 18 is fulfilled at different times, although it all appears as one sentence here. Finally, note that the last part of this verse says, And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Today, liberals will tell us to save the planet, and go green, so that the earth will remain in existence for millions of years to come. However, according to this verse, it is not an aerosol can, a plastic bag, or toxic waste from industry that destroys the earth. Rather, God says that sin destroys the earth. For example, when Cain killed Abel, God said, The voice of thy brother's blood creeth unto me from the ground, Genesis 4 verse 10. Therefore, if liberals were truly concerned about saving the earth, they would tell people to recognize their sin, which is the real thing that is destroying the earth, and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Revelation 11 verse 19, people wonder where the Ark of the Testament or Covenant is today. Well, if they just read this verse, they would know that it is currently in heaven. Note that the verse says, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. This means that, when God judges the Jews, they will see the ark, as a reminder to them that God will judge them, according to the law covenant he made with them in Exodus 19. Lightnings would be the spiritual creatures of God, flying at the speed of light to the earth to execute God's judgment, Ezekiel 1 verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks this judgment, and so the voices heard are of God and of high-ranking angels, relaying God's word so that the lower-ranking angels can execute God's judgment. When God speaks, his voice thunders, John 12 verses 28 to 29, which explains the thunderings. The earthquakes as a result of God's thundering voice. Then, the great hail is added to remove any doubt about this being God's judgment of men. Chapter 12 This chapter gives a broad overview of the prophecy program, so that the believing remnant will understand that Satan's attack of them in the Great Tribulation is severe. In Genesis 11, God gave Satan control of the Gentile nations, verse 3, but God is still over them through the nation of Israel, which he created in Genesis 12, verses 1-2. to God promises redemption for all men through the seed of Abraham. Therefore, Satan stands ready to destroy Jesus when he is born, verse 4. In his zeal to destroy Jesus, Satan unknowingly causes God's redemption plan to come to pass, and Jesus is exalted to God's throne, verse 5. This gives God the power to overthrow Satan and his angels in the heavenly places, replacing them with the body of Christ, verses 7 to 9. With Satan being cast down to the earth for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, he tries to destroy saved Israel, 
but God seals them so that the devil cannot touch them, verses 13 to 16. This leaves only the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that is not part of the 144,000, and so Satan makes war with them, verse 17, to try to destroy them. This war is called Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21, because it is Satan's last chance to keep God from reconciling the earth back to himself. Revelation 12 verse 1, although the word, and signals that chapter 12 is part of the seventh trumpet judgment, we need to keep in mind that God is not presenting these events in chronological order. In terms of when chapter 12 happens, the timeline is all over the place. The point of chapter 12 is to show God's deliverance of believers from Satan through the power of the cross. Therefore, while the world follows the Antichrist and Satan during the tribulation period, they have a choice not to be enslaved by him, but to have eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 12 tells how to be overcomers. In 12 colon 1, a woman with the sun, the moon, and 12 stars appears. Genesis 37 verses 9 to 10 tells us that this woman is the nation of Israel, in whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It further tells us that the sun and moon would be the father of Jacob and mother of Rachel of Israel, and the twelve stars are the twelve tribes. Thus, the time of this woman's appearance in heaven is Genesis 12 verse 1, which is the birth of the nation of Israel. It is no coincidence that we are also in chapter 12, verse 1 of the book of Revelation. Since 12 colon 1 starts with, and this tells us that the way that God brings about Revelation 11 verses 17 to 19 is through the nation of Israel. Revelation 11 verses 17 to 19 is judgment. Well, Genesis 11 verses 17 to 19 mentions Eber, from whom the name Hebrew comes. It also mentions Peleg. Peleg means divided. Genesis 10 verse 25 says that the earth was divided in his days. This was God's judgment of the Gentiles. Thus in Genesis 11 to 12, we see a foreshadowing of God's judgment of the Gentiles and God's mercy upon the Hebrews, which are ultimately fulfilled in the judgment and mercy found in Revelation 11 to 12. Revelation 12 verse 2, we will learn from 12 colon 5 that this child is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Redeemer, as promised in Genesis 3 verse 15, and he came through the nation of Israel. Pain and travail in childbirth is a punishment upon women for sin, Genesis 3 verse 16. Now, because Jesus did not have an earthly father, he did not have the sin nature imparted to him. Therefore, the traveling in birth and pain to be delivered, Revelation 12 verse 2, of Israel in giving birth to Jesus shows the sin of Israel. Jesus had the proper lineage, i.e., through Eve, Abraham, and David, but it was a sinful lineage. You can read his genealogy in Matthew 1, and find sin from generation to generation in Jesus' line. For example, Abraham begot Isaac after first having Ishmael out of wedlock, Genesis 16 verses 3 to 4. Judah had twin boys from an incestual relationship, Genesis 38. David came from great-grandparents with some Moabitish blood that, if David had been born a generation earlier, would have prevented him from being able to even enter the temple, Deuteronomy 23 verse 3, Ruth 4 verses 18 to 22. Solomon's father and mother were David and Bathsheba, who committed adultery together, 2 Samuel 11 verses 2 to 4. Manasseh was the most wicked king, 2 Chronicles 33 verses 1 to 9. Yes, all of these people are in Jesus' lineage. The point is that Jesus is not the Savior because of the holiness of the nation, Israel, he came from. Rather, a holy child is born out of an unholy nation, which works because the man is responsible for the sin, see Adam and Eve, and Jesus is the seed of the woman, Genesis 3 verse 15, with his father being God himself. In other words, Jesus could come from the sinful line of Israel and still have no sin, because his father, God, has no sin. Revelation 12 verse 3, Now, before Israel was born, another wonder appeared in heaven. From Revelation 12 verse 9, we learn that the great red dragon, Revelation 12 verse 3, is the devil. Lucifer became Satan and appeared as a great, red dragon when iniquity was found in him, Ezekiel 28 verse 15. The dragon has seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. In 13 colon 1, we will see that the beast also has seven heads and ten horns, 
although he has ten crowns, instead of seven. With regard to the beast, Revelation 17 verses 9 to 12 says that the seven heads are seven mountains, and there are seven kings. The ten horns are ten kings. The woman sits on the seven heads, Revelation 17 verse 9, and she reigns over the kings of the earth, Revelation 17 verse 18. This woman is Mystery Babylon, not Israel, Revelation 17 verses 4 to 5. We can use this information to figure out what is going on in Revelation 12 verses 1 to 3. The great, red dragon gets all of the Gentile kingdoms on earth when God gives them up in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel, Satan told Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world are delivered unto me, Luke 4 verses 5 to 6, dot, but the woman, Israel, is still over the Gentile kingdoms, when she appears in Genesis 12, because Israel is God's nation. Therefore, what we see so far is that, at the Tower of Babel, the devil got control of all of the Gentile nations, but God is still in control over the devil through the nation of Israel. Revelation 12 verse 4, the devil's drawing one-third of the stars of heaven down to the earth means that, when Satan rebelled, he convinced one-third of the angelic realm to rebel with him. They are not actually cast out of heaven and down to the earth until halfway through the tribulation period, as Revelation 12 colon 7 9, 12 states. However, since God is outside of time, he sees them, here, as being cast to the earth already. From Daniel 10 verse 21, we can conclude that the one-third of the angelic realm, that sided with the devil, included all of the higher-ranking angels, except for Gabriel and Michael. The devil realized that, if he could devour Israel's child, i.e., Jesus Christ, he would rule the earth entirely, having gotten rid of Israel. Therefore, from the time that Jesus was born, the devil tried to devour him. The first attack is seen by having Herod kill all children two years, and under in Bethlehem, Matthew 2 verse 16. His last attack was having Jesus crucified, Matthew 27 verse 35. If the devil knew that by having Jesus crucified, God was saving the heaven and the earth, rather than the devil gaining control of the heaven and the earth, the devil would not have had him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. Revelation 12 verse 5, because Jesus lived a perfect life, 1 Peter 2 verse 22, and was crucified on a tree, being made a curse under the law, Galatians 3 verse 13, his death was not the devouring of Israel's child. Rather, it fulfilled the curse provision under the law, Deuteronomy 21 verses 22 to 23, so that Jews, under the law covenant, are saved by Jesus' perfect sacrifice as the Lamb of God. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, the justice of God required that he not stay in hell and suffer corruption, Psalm 16 verse 10. Rather, God raised him from the dead, Acts 3 15, for 10. Jesus was caught up unto God, and to his throne, Revelation 12 verse 5. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool, Acts 2 verses 34 to 35. Therefore, Satan's attempt to devour Jesus was really his own undoing, as it resulted in God gaining the power over death and hell, Jesus said, I have the keys of hell and of death, Revelation 1 verse 18, dot, so that he can set up God's eternal kingdom on earth. The way that we know that the child of Revelation 12 verses 2 and 5 is the Lord Jesus Christ is by being told that he will rule all nations with a rod of iron, Revelation 12 verse 5. We see this applied to the Son of God in Psalm 2 verses 7 to 9, and to the Word of God in Revelation 19 verse 15, both of whom are the Lord Jesus Christ. This also shows us why the devil is so adamant about trying to devour the child. In Revelation 12 verse 3, we see the devil ruling all nations except Israel. Then, God promises that Israel's child will take the nations away from him. So, naturally, the devil tries to devour Jesus Christ. By the way, the time when the Lord Jesus Christ does rule the nations with a rod of iron is in his millennial reign, note from Revelation 19 verse 15, that his rule is still future at his second coming. The rod of iron is the law covenant. We see this from Isaiah's description of the nations going to Zion during the millennial reign, and out of Zion shall go forth the law, Isaiah 2 verse 3. Revelation 12 verse 6, Since the devil was unable to destroy Israel's child, his next plan is to destroy Israel herself. After all, if God now has the power to set up his kingdom on earth, 
the only thing stopping him from doing so is having saved Israel on the earth to rule over the nations. Since God promised Israel would rule over the nations, Deuteronomy 32 verse 8, Revelation 1 colon 6, 20 colon 6, Israel's failure to be saved would result in God's failure to set up his kingdom on earth. Therefore, God sends his two witnesses to build up believers in Israel during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, Revelation 11 verses 3 to 4. Then, halfway through the tribulation period, 144,000 Jews are saved and sealed by God, chapter 7. They then are safe from the spiritual attacks of the devil during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period by being in the wilderness, in a place prepared of God, where she is fed during that time, Revelation 12 verse 6. People will say that this wilderness is some place that is not on this earth, since she is given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness, Revelation 12 verse 14. However, Jesus taught that saved Israel is to reach the lost sheep of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 8, and that they would not finish going to them before the end of the tribulation period. Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. So how can believing Israel reach the lost sheep of Israel with the gospel if they are up in heaven somewhere? Thus, this wilderness is on the earth and is probably like the place that Elijah stayed in. Elijah prayed to the Lord, and God stopped rain from coming to Israel for three and a half years, James 5 verse 17, which is the exact amount of time that Israel will be in the wilderness for the last half of the tribulation period. During those three and a half years, God told Elijah to hide by a brook, where God had commanded ravens to feed him, 1 Kings 17 verses 3 to 5. The ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook, 1 Kings 17 verse 6. Then, when the brook dried up, the Lord told Elijah to go to Zarephath, where a widow woman would feed him, 1 Kings 17 verse 9. Similarly, the 144,000 will go to the place that God tells them to go to, and God will feed them, probably by birds. Then, when they go to the cities to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel, God will feed them by believing Gentiles giving them food, Matthew 25 verses 35 to 40. Or they may go without food, as Jesus did when he was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, Matthew 4 verse 1. He ate nothing at all in those 40 days, Matthew 4 verse 2. Also, as we noted in the notes in Revelation 7 verses 1 to 3, Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness, and he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Therefore believing Israel's nourishment from God will primarily be the word of God, so that they do not take the mark of the beast, as they journey to the cities of Israel with the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work, John 4 verses 32 and 34. That is the primary food that the 144,000 will eat during the Great Tribulation. They will feed on God's word, which will cause them to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 6 to 8. Their wilderness then ends up being the cities of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 23, in fulfillment of Psalm 23 verses 4 to 5. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It is no coincidence, then, that Jesus calls part of Israel the shadow of death, when he was on this earth, Matthew 4 verses 15 to 16, as mentioned in Isaiah 9 verses 1 to 2. Thus, God protects the 144,000 and feeds them in the midst of the spiritual wilderness of Babylon during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period so that they can reach the rest of Israel in order for them to be saved, also Romans 11 verse 26. Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9, the war in heaven takes place halfway through the tribulation period. We know this from 12 14, where it says that there are three and a half years left for the serpent to reign a time and times, and half a time equals one plus two plus one half is equal to three half a years. We can also see this from 13 colon 5 that the beast has power for 42 months, which is three and a half years. 
Revelation 12 verse 7 does not give us details of the war. It just says that the devil and his angels were cast out of heaven and into the earth. We can assume, then, that this is a total victory with no fatalities on God's side, which is the side of Michael and his angels. This is the event that is also mentioned in Daniel 12 verse 1. Again, a chapter 12 is a reference to a verse in Revelation 12. There Michael is said to be the prince of Israel. Therefore he fights for Israel to overthrow the devil, who is the ruler of all of the Gentile nations at the time. With regard to the devil and his angels, we are told neither was their place found any more in heaven, Revelation 12 verse 8. The rapture of the church, the body of Christ, occurs at least three and a half years before this war in heaven. Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23 and 2 colon 6 indicate that Jesus Christ has placed us, the church, the body of Christ, in rulership positions in the heavenly places. Therefore, once we are raptured up, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be given our reward of a position in heavenly places, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 11 to 15. Having people to fill the positions that the devil and his angels are currently in, the Lord Jesus Christ, via Michael and the angels under him, will win the war in heaven against the devil and his angels, such that the devil and his angels will not have their heavenly positions anymore. They will be cast down into the earth, and the church, the body of Christ, will fill those positions in heavenly places for all eternity. By the way, I would not be a bit surprised if the way the devil and his angels are cast out is by Michael simply saying to the devil, The Lord rebuke thee, Jude 9, as he did regarding the dispute over Moses' body. After all, by this point in time, the body of Christ is already in heaven and has been given their positions of authority, which Jesus Christ can give since he triumphed over principalities and powers in the cross, Colossians 2 verse 15. Therefore, all that may be left at this time to cast the devil and his angels out of heaven may be for Michael simply to say, The Lord rebuke thee. Revelation 12 verses 10 to 12, the proclamation, in 12 colon 10 dash 12, is to the tribulation saints, who have been killed for trusting in God to save them through his law covenant with them. Although this event happens at the middle of the tribulation period, the proclamation is to all the tribulation saints, who will be killed during the great tribulation, as if they have already been killed and are in heaven, waiting for Jesus' second coming. This is possible because Romans 4 verse 17 says that God calleth those things which be not as though they were. In Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21, we are told that the body of Christ waits from heaven, even though we are on the earth, for Jesus Christ to come and change our bodies. Therefore, the bride of Christ can also wait from heaven for Jesus Christ to come and set up his kingdom on earth, even though they are still physically on the earth. Salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have now come to the heavenly places because Satan can no longer approach God's throne and accuse the saved before our God day and night Revelation 12 verse 10, since his place was no longer found in heaven Revelation 12 verse 8. An example of Satan's accusation of the brethren before God's throne is found in Job 1 verses 6 to 12 and 2 colon 1 dash 6. Therefore, the rejoicing in heaven is over not having to deal with Satan up there anymore, and over having the kingdom of God set up in heavenly places now. The fact that Satan accuses the saved before our God day and night shows just how integral man's salvation is to fulfilling God's plan. The man, Christ Jesus, lived a perfect life, always doing the Father's will. His perfect life is then counted for believers so that we receive the gift of eternal life or Romans 6 verse 23. Christ then lives in us, Galatians 2 verse 20, for all eternity, accomplishing God's will through us. If Satan can find just one fault of Christ sinning through believing Israel, then Christ is not perfect and Satan wins. Therefore, Satan spends night and day accusing believers and God says every time, no, that sin was in their flesh. It was not Christ committing that sin through them. It is no wonder, then, that the heavens rejoice that Satan cannot do this any more from this point on. Revelation 12 verse 11 tells us that those in heaven rejoicing are the martyrs from the great tribulation period, since they loved not their lives unto the death. They trusted in God's promise to bring them into God's eternal kingdom on earth, which is accomplished through the blood of the Lamb being applied to their souls. Since they are martyrs, they were told to bow down to the image of the beast, and they would not do so. 
Therefore they also overcame by the word of their testimony, Revelation 12 verse 11. It is interesting to note that they overcame Satan, even though Revelation 13 verse 7 says that the Antichrist is given the power to make war with the saints and to overcome them. This shows the free will of men in operation. Mun has the free will to choose to believe the gospel and receive salvation from God by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 12 verse 11, or he can choose to take the mark and worship the image of the beast and be overcome by the Antichrist. Revelation 12 verse 12, while the heavens are rejoicing over finally being cleansed, the earth is in a heap of trouble, because the devil is come down unto them, Revelation 12 verse 12. In Revelation 8 verse 13, we were told that three woes were coming. The first woe was men on earth being tormented for five months, Revelation 9 verse 5. The second woe was one third of men being killed, Revelation 9 verse 18. Now, the third woe upon men is the great wrath of the devil, inflicted upon men for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, such that Matthew 24 verse 21 calls this time, Great Tribulation. This is the worst woe, because the first two woes were sent by God to hurt men physically so that they would believe the gospel and receive eternal life. However, this third woe is Satan instituting capital punishment for those who will not bow down to the image of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 15. If they do bow down, God says they will spend eternity in the lake of fire, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. Therefore, this third will probably results in billions of people sealing their eternity in the lake of fire. When 12.12 says that the devil knows that he hath but a short time, it does not mean that he knows that he will soon be defeated, because the devil's pride keeps him from ever thinking that. Rather, it means that he knows he only has a short time to regroup and gather up his troops to prepare for the final battle against God. Therefore, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, Revelation 12 verse 9, will have his greatest period of deception ever during the Great Tribulation, so that he can make his army as strong as possible for the final war against God. Revelation 12 verse 13, Since God has declared that he will reconcile the earth back to himself through the nation of Israel, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, when the devil is cast unto the earth, his first attack is to persecute Israel. When he tries to do this, God protects believing Israel by sealing, the servants of our God in their foreheads, Revelation 7 verse 3. Thus, 144,000 believing Jews are kept from denying Christ during the Great Tribulation. This is not God going against their free will, because they have already chosen to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Thus, God's sealing of them is based upon their free will choice to believe, just like our sealing, as the body of Christ, is today, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14. Revelation 12 verse 14, this sealing by God is what is meant by giving the 144,000 two wings of a great eagle. As mentioned in Revelation 12 verse 6, this does not mean that she flies away off of the earth to some safe haven in the heaven. Rather, Israel stays on the earth. The reason we know this is because she flies to a wilderness. If she flew to heaven, she would be in paradise, Abraham's bosom, or some other like place. Also, Israel has to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the gospel during the last half of the tribulation period, especially since the devil will make war with new believers, Revelation 12 verse 17. Believing Israel is nourished for three and a half years by God's word to them, and by doing the will of God, which is to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. A time equals one year. Therefore a time, one year, and times, two years, and half a time, half a year, equal one plus two plus one half is equal to three half a years. This is the great tribulation period. God protects the 144,000 from the face of the serpent, meaning that God gives them the faith of Christ to keep from denying Christ. If they are arrested and brought before the image of the beast, they will not bow down to it, because the Holy Ghost will speak through them, Mark 13 verse 11. This is also how the gospel is published among all nations, Mark 13 verse 10, even though believing Israel does not finish going over all the cities of Israel before Jesus' second coming, Matthew 10 verse 23. In other words, the gift of tongues is given to believing Israel, and the Holy Ghost will speak to the lost sheep of the house of Israel all over the world in the languages that they understand. This would not happen if the 144,000 were completely removed from the earth. 
Also, Revelation 17 verse 3 says that Babylon is in the wilderness, which means that believing Israel is still on the earth. Revelation 12 verses 15 to 16, the fact that the 144,000 are still on the earth, is shown here in that the earth swallows up the flood that the dragon sent out of his mouth. In Revelation 19 verse 15, we see the word of God come out of the mouth of Jesus Christ to destroy his enemies. Therefore, what comes out of the serpent's mouth, here, is Satan's lie program. Satan is known as the dragon, and the sea is his domain. Therefore, it makes sense that he would spew out a flood. This flood of waters, that comes out of the devil's mouth, is his lies, found in the Babylonian religious system. Note that he tries to cause the woman, to be carried away of the flood, Revelation 12 verse 15. Satan wants the 144,000 to believe his lies so that they will abandon faith in God and be lost forever in the lake of fire, because, if he can destroy saved Israel in this manner, God will not set up his kingdom on earth, because he will not have a nation to rule over the Gentiles. That is what has kept God from setting up his eternal kingdom on earth for the past 3,500 years and counting. It is at this time that God seals the 144,000 as seen in Revelation 7. The earth then swallows up the flood that the dragon cast out of his mouth. When Cain killed Abel, God said that Abel's blood creeth unto me from the ground, and that the earth hath opened her mouth to receive Abel's blood Genesis 4 verses 10 to 11. Whenever righteous blood is shed, the earth swallows it up, and God has promised to bring judgment upon the serpents and generation of vipers Matthew 23 verse 33, who shed all of the righteous blood Matthew 23 verse 35. The reason for this judgment is that, by swallowing up this righteous blood, the whole creation groaneth, and traveleth in pain together until now Romans 8 verse 22. What this means is that the earth desperately wants God to redeem it. Therefore, when Satan casts a flood of lies out of his mouth, the earth swallows it up to keep the dragon from flooding out the 144,000. I do not know exactly what the earth does. However, 7 colon 1 dash 3 tells us that four angels held the four winds of the earth to keep the wind from blowing, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Remember that God sent Elijah to a certain place to be fed by ravens, 1 Kings 17 verses 3 to 4, for 3, and a half years, James 5 verse 17, and Jesus told believing Israel that, when they see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, they are to flee into the mountains, Matthew 24 verses 15 to 16. Therefore it seems that the wilderness to which believing Israel is to flee, is the mountains surrounding Judea. Also remember that God saved Israel from experiencing some of the plagues in Egypt under Moses, example, Exodus 10 verses 21 to 23. Therefore, what probably happens is that the 144,000 are sealed, the abomination of desolation is set up, believing Israel goes to the mountains, and the earth swallows up the flood of lies coming from the devil so that they do not reach believing Israel, because they are out of the cities where the Babylonian system is its strongest. The earth's topography also probably protects believing Israel from some of the plagues of the tribulation period and keeps apostate Israel from capturing them, as the mountains helped David when he fled from Saul, 1 Samuel 23 verse 14. This makes sense in light of Romans 8 verse 19, which says that the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Therefore, once the sons of God of Israel's program are manifest through them being sealed, the earth protects them in the mountains to keep Satan's policy of evil from poisoning their minds so that the earth can be redeemed and purged of all of the righteous blood that has been shed by the Babylonian religious system's generation of vipers. Revelation 12 verse 17 the devil soon realizes that he cannot penetrate God's seal on the 144,000. This makes him wroth because he cannot destroy believing Israel. He tried to devour Jesus, and that did not work, Revelation 12 verses 4 to 5. He tried to devour the 144,000 saved of Israel, and that did not work, Revelation 12 verses 15 to 16. Therefore, the only thing he has left is to focus on destroying, the remnant of her seed, Revelation 12 verse 17. Remember that Jesus said that this time is great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, Matthew 24 verse 21. The reason is because the devil has been kicked out of heaven. Therefore, the devil is come down unto the earth, 
having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, Revelation 12 verse 12. The rest of Revelation 12 verse 17 tells us that the devil's attack is not on all Jews, because many in Israel are still apostate. Satan's focus in the Great Tribulation is to attack the believing remnant of Israel, who keep the commandments of God, Revelation 12 verse 17, meaning that they believe the gospel of the kingdom, and are water baptized, as they were commanded to do in Acts 2 verse 38, in order to flee from God's wrath. They also have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12 verse 17, meaning that they testify that Jesus is the Christ, rather than the Antichrist being the Christ, 1 John 4 verses 2 to 3. These are the only people Satan can affect to get them to join his side. Therefore, they will go through great tribulation. This is why Jesus tells them to flee into the mountains, Matthew 24 verse 16. It is also to this group that the Lord Jesus Christ addresses most of his comments in Matthew John. The reason for this is that the deception program of Satan is so strong during the great tribulation that if God did not end it after three and a half years, there should no flesh be saved, Matthew 24 verse 22. Yet, all of the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, must be saved, Romans 11 verse 26, or else God's promise is not true, making God a liar and Satan wins. Therefore, Satan concentrates all of his deception, which he has honed over the past 6,000 years, on keeping the lost sheep of the house of Israel from being saved during these last three and a half years before Jesus' second coming. Revelation 13 For the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, God allows Satan to take control of the world through his false religious system of Babylon, implemented by his false trinity, himself as the Father, the Antichrist as the Son, and the false prophet as the Holy Ghost. The world worships the Antichrist because he kills the two witnesses, Revelation 11 verse 7, and because he, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, and the false prophet do great wonders and miracles to deceive the world, verses 13 to 14. Today, Satan has already prepared the world to worship the image of the beast, via female deities that are present in all religions, especially the Virgin Mary in Catholicism. He has also prepared the world to take his mark, via the Hindu dot, ashes on the forehead of Catholics, phylacteries on the forehead of Jews, prayer bumps on the foreheads of Muslims, and technological advances for atheists, technology is the god of atheists. Satan has also trained churchianity today to give out false doctrine regarding the image and the mark of the beast, in order to trick those, who think they have knowledge of the situation, into bowing down to the image and taking the mark. Therefore, the world will not have the ears to hear, verse 9, and will willingly seal their eternal deaths in the lake of fire by worshipping the image of the beast, and by taking the mark of the beast, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. Revelation 13 verse 1, Note that the beast rises up out of the sea. This is because the sea is Satan's domain, as seen in 17 1, where the great whore, i.e., Babylon, sitteth upon many waters. Therefore the fact that the beast rises up out of the sea, when Jesus rose from the grave, should be proof enough that the beast is of the devil. Satan's first part of the war plan is to raise up a beast. The Antichrist is a moon during the first three, and a half years of the tribulation period. Based on Revelation 11 verse 5 and 13 colon 3, we can conclude that the Antichrist, the Mun, is killed by the two witnesses at the end of the first half of the tribulation period. Satan knows that he needs to get into the temple and institute satanic worship in the temple if he is ever going to get the believing remnant of Israel to become apostate, so he can continue, as the god of this world, which is why the Antichrist made a seven-year covenant with Israel in the first place. Unbelieving men follows the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2 verse 16. In the days of Noah, every imagination of the thoughts of a man's heart was only evil continually, Genesis 6 verse 5. In the tribulation period, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of men be, Matthew 24 verse 37. Therefore, the wickedness of men is so great during this time, that 2 Peter 2 verse 12 and Jude 10 call unbelievers natural brute beasts. In other words, they are so far removed from God's plan, that all man does is operate by the instincts of his own lusts, such that, spiritually speaking, he is a beast. Therefore, once the Antichrist has been dead for three days, Satan resurrects him as a beast. 
He will then claim that he has fulfilled the prophecy of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ, and he has now received his glorified body. To believing men, the glorified body is what Jesus had, a body that operates well both in the material and the spiritual realms. However, for unbelieving men, who follows his own lusts as natural brute beasts do, the perfect glorified body is that of the beast. We see this in the fact that all the world wondered after the beast and said, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13 verses 3 to 4 In other words, we finally have a creature that is unstoppable in doing all the lusts of the flesh. Let's worship him. Satan has seen how God cast him out of heaven by having a woman, Israel, over Satan's kings, and the power to overthrow Satan's kingdom in heaven came from the Christ, who proceeded from Israel. Therefore Satan sets up a similar situation for himself on earth so that he may overthrow God's saints on earth, and at least keep the earth for himself. The beast is Satan's Christ, by which he plans to overthrow God on earth. Revelation 17 verses 9 to 12 says that the seven heads represent seven kingdoms. Those are the kingdoms on earth during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. The ten horns are ten kings, who will gain power, the ten crowns, by coming into a confederacy with the Antichrist underneath him. The fact that the beast has all of the heads, horns, and crowns on him, shows that he will be the one in charge on the world during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. The fact that the name of blasphemy, Revelation 13 verse 1, is on all of his heads, shows that his religion, on which he will hang his power, is a false religion, full of lies, that goes contrary to what God has established with Israel's law covenant. We see this from Daniel. The Antichrist obtains the kingdom in Israel by flatteries, Daniel 11 verse 21. He makes a seven-year covenant with Israel to obey God's law, Daniel 9 verse 27. However, once he arises as a beast, in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate, Daniel 9 verse 27. This is when he changes from being one of the seven kings in the world to being the one, world ruler, Revelation 17 verses 11 to 13. This is what is meant by the seven heads and ten horns of Revelation 13 verse 1. Then, the Antichrist will claim that he is fulfilling Isaiah 42 verse 6 by being a light of the Gentiles. Thus, the Great Tribulation begins a three and a half year period of time in which Satan mimics God's kingdom on earth with a resurrected Christ and the supposed fulfillment of scripture, but he does so according to the lusts of the flesh, which is why it is attractive to men. In other words, God gives believing men what is best spiritually speaking, which shows the vileness of our flesh, Hebrews 4 verse 12. Meanwhile, Satan gives men what is best materially speaking, and cloaks it in a form of godliness. The result is the great tribulation, in which man follows the lusts of his own flesh while being duped into thinking he is pleasing God. Israel will be so deceived that they will think that the Antichrist is the true Christ and is giving them positions of authority in the kingdom, as God promised Israel in the Old Testament. Remember that Satan wars against the remnant of Israel's seed in the last half of the tribulation period, Revelation 12 verse 17. Therefore Satan's deceptive plan will be so successful that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, Matthew 24 verse 24. Revelation 13 verse 2, Daniel 7 tells of four beasts. They represent four kings, which shall arise out of the earth, Daniel 7 verse 17. The first was like a lion, the second like to a bear, and the third like a leopard, Daniel 7 verses 4 to 6. The fourth beast ends up being the Antichrist, Daniel 7 verses 19 to 21. Based on the description of him, here in 13 colon 2, we see that the Antichrist is a composite beast of the first three. He is like unto a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion, Revelation 13 verse 2. This makes the Antichrist, the beast, a conquering machine. The dragon gives him power, such that Satan rules over the whole world through the Antichrist. Think of television and movies today. As more and more of these pictures become digital, they become more and more grotesque. It used to be that horror movies only came out around Halloween. 
Now, some people watch new horror flicks all of the time. This satisfies the lusts of the flesh because the flesh wants to be a brute beast. Therefore, when Satan resurrects the Antichrist as a beast, he gives the world what they want. First, the Antichrist is like unto a leopard. Leopards are known for being incredibly strong. They can sometimes kill prey that are three times their size, because God made their bodies to be natural hunters. The Antichrist also has the feet of a bear, which is important, because it means he can stand and walk upright. Then, the Antichrist has the mouth of a lion. Therefore, as a leopard, he can catch and kill prey better than other beasts. His feet give him the ability to walk upright, and his mouth gives him the ability to devour his prey. As such, this composite beast is the ultimate beast for fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. The Antichrist's physical body shows what he is like spiritually. 1 John 2 verse 16 says that all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. A leopard is best at fulfilling the lust of the flesh by catching the biggest prey. A bear is best at fulfilling the lust of the eyes by seeing things on man's level by standing up, by seeing things on an animal's level by being on all fours, and by seeing things underwater, as seen in their ability to catch and eat salmon swimming upstream. A lion is best at fulfilling the pride of life by being king of the jungle. A group of lions is even called a pride. Thus, Satan creates a composite beast in the Antichrist, which is the ultimate in fulfilling all the lusts that are in the world, making him the most desirable of all creatures to wicked, unbelieving men. This is why the whole world will worship him. Then, we are told that the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. From 6 colon 2, we learn that Satan was given a crown at the beginning of the tribulation period, and went forth to conquer. I believe the crown he was given was over apostate Israel. Then, he went forth to conquer, and was able to place the Antichrist in rule over the whole world by the midpoint of the tribulation period. Thus, the Antichrist is the ultimate beast, and he has ultimate power over the world. It appears that nothing slash no one can stop him. Of course, looks can be deceiving. Revelation 13 verse 3, Revelation 11 verse 5 says that, if a man tries to hurt the two witnesses, he must be killed. The Antichrist, the man, was killed by the two witnesses. Satan then raises him up as a beast. Thus, he has a head that was killed that has now been healed. He already claimed to be the Christ. Now that he has been killed and raised from the dead, the Antichrist will deceive even more people into thinking that he is the Christ, because he appears to be unstoppable. In other words, even death cannot stop him. This is why the world wonders after him. Revelation 17 verse 8 says that those who wonder after him are those whose names were not written in the book of life. Therefore, they will have no trouble worshipping his image and taking his mark. In reference to Jesus Christ, Zechariah 13 verse 6 says, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Thus, this verse prophesies of Jesus' crucifixion. However, the Antichrist will be wounded in the head, not in the hands. That is no problem for Satan. Zechariah 13 verse 6 in the Message Bible says that the Christ's wound occurred in the head from walking into a door. The Message Bible says, and so where did you get that black eye? They'll say, I ran into a door at a friend's house. Thus, the satanically inspired Message Bible provides the excuse that the Antichrist will use for his deadly wound to the head. He will say that he ran into a door, rather than being killed by the two witnesses. Revelation 13 verse 4, Therefore, these unbelievers in God will become believers in Satan and his Christ, the Antichrist. When he is resurrected by Satan, the first thing the beast does is he kills the two witnesses, Revelation 11 verse 7. Now, the two witnesses have been standing before the God of the earth, Revelation 11 verse 4, keeping the Antichrist and his people from entering the temple. They have also been pronouncing judgment for three and a half years upon the world for their ungodliness, Jude 15. As such, all unbelievers hate the two witnesses, such that they rejoice over the two witnesses' deaths, make merry, and send gifts one to another, Revelation 11 verse 10. These sickos even go so far as to leave their dead bodies in the street for three 
and a half days, so they can watch their dead bodies decay, Revelation 11 verse 9. Because the people of the world are evil, they want evil to win, John 3 verse 19. People have tried for over three years to kill the two witnesses, and have been unsuccessful. Now, the beast comes along and gets rid of the two witnesses. In their evil thinking, then, the beast is the Christ, because he has saved his people from the judgment of the two witnesses. Therefore they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13 verse 4. Therefore by getting rid of the two witnesses, the beast has allowed evil to abound in this world, causing unbelievers to hail him as their savior, the Antichrist is unbelievers' savior from God giving them judgment in hell. Note also that they worship the dragon, because he gave power to the beast, just like Christians worship God the Father, who gives power to God the Son. Thus, Satan has developed a false religion that imitates what God has set up. The answer to the question of who is like unto the beast. Revelation 13 verse 4, is who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods. Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Exodus 15 verse 11. Therefore, the answer to the question of who is able to make war with him. Revelation 13 verse 4, is the Lord is my strength and song, and he is become my salvation, he is my God. The Lord is a man of war, Exodus 15 verses 2 to 3. Those who know that the Lord is God, will believe the gospel of the kingdom, and wait for their redemption from the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation. Those only concerned with the lusts of the flesh, will side with the Antichrist to get their lust satisfied. It is a funny thing about sin. Because sin leads to destruction, even if God removes sentence against evil, those, following their own lusts, will eventually destroy themselves. In other words, if God let the Antichrist rule longer than the tribulation period, the world would eventually destroy itself by following sin. James 1 verse 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Therefore the only true Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes at the end of the tribulation period to save the elect. He comes at that time because, if he waited any longer, there would be no one left to save, Matthew 24 verse 22. This shows that sin, unabated, destroys the soul in about three and a half years. When looking at the world today, this shows the power of God's love. Here is Satan, as the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, causing most everyone, including Christians, to follow the course of this world, Ephesians 2 verse 2. Yet, there is a little bit of God's love coming through believers, and that little bit of love is enough to keep the world from completely destroying itself for the last 2,000 years. How much more glorious, then, will this world be when sin is completely removed and only God's love comes through believers for all eternity? Revelation 13 verse 5, Anybody can speak great things about himself. Therefore, for the Antichrist to be given a mouth, it probably indicates that Satan gives him the knowledge of scripture that Satan has, which means that the Antichrist will be twisting scripture better than anyone else, in order to substantiate his claims of great things about himself and Satan. This is how the dragon gave him his power, Revelation 13 verse 2. If you look at cults, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they are successful because they have taken years to refine their knowledge so that they become experts at explaining away scriptures that go against their teachings. Thus, they make their lies more convincing and draw more people to their cult. Since the Antichrist will supernaturally be given the ability to fool people through Satan giving him a mouth, his ability to fool people with lies is greatly magnified such that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect Matthew 24 verse 24. Specifically, the Antichrist will ascribe messianic scriptures to himself and God the Father's scriptures to Satan. Therefore he speaks great things about himself by speaking blasphemies, is not this what churchianity does today, ascribing all of the evil, associated with Satan, to God, while giving all the good attributes of God and Christ to Satan and himself, respectively. Because he has the knowledge and tricks of Satan, the Antichrist will be thoroughly convincing. This is why God only allows him to do this for 42 months, and it is why these 42 months are known as Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21. In other words, Great Tribulation is not God pouring his wrath upon men, but it is a man, the Antichrist, speaking lies just as eloquently as Jesus spoke the truth. 
Jesus' earthly ministry resulted in 120 people being saved, Acts 1 verse 15, because the flesh feeds on lies. Therefore, the Antichrist's eloquent lies result in nearly the whole world being lost, which is why he can only be the world's ruler for 42 months. This is in spite of the fact that God will have his believing remnant of 144,000 preaching the gospel and performing great miracles during this time. The fact that the Antichrist is stopped after 42 months shows that God is not powerless to stop him, as the Antichrist will claim. Rather, God will allow Satan to give power to the Antichrist for three and a half years, John 19 verses 10 to 11, so that God may purify Israel through this great tribulation of deceit, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 4. Revelation 13 verse 6, the Antichrist speaks blasphemy against God, Revelation 13 verse 6, which means he ascribes evil to God. He also blasphemes the things of God, which are his name and his tabernacle. Therefore, the Antichrist will institute his false religion, saying that it is of God, and he will put non-holy things in the tabernacle, such as the abomination of desolation. This is how he blasphemies God's name and his tabernacle. The Antichrist also blasphemes them that dwell in heaven, Revelation 13 verse 6. This would be, predominantly, the body of Christ. He will say that the body of Christ followed the evil one, Jehovah God, and so the evil one took them away while the Antichrist will say that the true God needs to be worshipped, which he will say is the devil. Therefore, the Antichrist will turn things upside down good is evil, and evil is good. People will believe him because, one, he appears to have the power as God, since he overthrew the two witnesses, made a covenant with Israel, and went about conquering kingdoms, and two, his false religion will line up perfectly with the sin nature and the lusts of the flesh. Today, churchianity is watered down and filled with doctrines of devils because people desire to follow the lusts of the flesh. Men uses scripture out of context to substantiate following the flesh. How much more, then, will this be the case, when Satan himself, through the Antichrist, sets up the false religious system of Babylon? And the way the Antichrist turns everything upside down is by blaspheming everything that is good. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, Isaiah 5 verse 20. Revelation 13 verse 7, it will appear that the Antichrist has power over all as God. That is why this verse makes it clear that, whatever power he has, was given unto him, Revelation 13 colon 7. Since the power is given unto him, the Antichrist is not God. In the instructions to the seven churches found in Revelation 2 to 3, the Spirit says to the churches that they can be overcomers. Yet, Revelation 13 verse 7 says that the Antichrist will overcome the saints. This is not a contradiction. Rather, the saints can still overcome the Antichrist and apostate Israel in the spiritual realm, such that they continue to have faith in God to bring them into the kingdom. Physically speaking, though, the Antichrist will make war with the saints and overcome them, such that he is able to enter into the temple, declare himself to be God, and physically kill some of the saints, Revelation 6 verses 9 to 11. Therefore, the saints spiritually overcome the Antichrist, even though the Antichrist physically overcomes the saints, and gets into the temple to desecrate it. The Antichrist also has power, over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations, Revelation 13 verse 7. Therefore, he will rule over the whole world. However, this does not include the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, because they are not to be reckoned among the nations, Numbers 23 9. In other words, God takes his kingdom away from the physical nation of Israel, Matthew 21 verse 43, and gives it to the little flock, Luke 12 verse 32, and the Antichrist has no spiritual power over the little flock because God's kingdom is not of this world, John 18 verse 36. It is very important for us to realize this because this means that the nation called Israel by the world that was re-established in 1948 is not God's nation. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, Romans 9 verse 6. In fact, the Star of David that is on today's Israeli flag is really a hexagram associated with Egyptian magic and witchcraft. Acts 7 verse 43 calls it the Star of your God Remphan, which is Saturn. How could such a pagan flag represent God's nation? Revelation 13 verses 8 to 9, 
Not only does the Antichrist have power over the whole earth, but all those, without faith in God, will worship the Antichrist. Note that Revelation 13 verse 9 says that you must have the spiritual ears to understand this is what is going on. This means that the worldwide worship of the Antichrist will be veiled in the worship of God. In other words the Antichrist will fool the world into thinking that, by worshipping the image of the beast, they are worshipping God. After all, Catholics bow down to an image of Mary today, and think they are serving God. Why wouldn't the world, then, think that they are worshipping God when they bow down to the Antichrist's image, which is of the Queen of Heaven? God says, I am the Lord, and there is none else, Isaiah 45 verses 5 to 6, and the Queen of Heaven says, I am, and none else beside me, Isaiah 47 verses 8 and 10. This is because the deception program of Satan under the Queen of Heaven is so strong that the world, by following their flesh, will believe that the Queen of Heaven is God. However, those, with the faith to hear what the Spirit is saying to them through God's Word, will recognize that idol for what it is and worship God instead. We should also note that Revelation 13 verse 8 says that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ was not actually slain until at least about 4,000 years after the world was created. However, God, calleth those things which be not as though they were Romans for verse 17. Because God is outside of time, he sees the Lamb as being slain from the foundation of the world, even though he was not actually slain until 4,000 years after God created Adam. Job 38 verse 6 says that God laid the foundations and the cornerstone of the earth. Psalm 104 verse 5 says that the foundations of the earth will not be moved forever. Isaiah 28 verse 16 says that the foundation and cornerstone were laid in Zion. Ephesians 2 verse 20 reveals this cornerstone as being the Lord Jesus Christ. By putting these verses together with Revelation 13 verse 8, we can conclude that Jesus' death is the foundation or cornerstone of the earth, which keeps it in place forever. In other words, because men's sins and sins lead to death, God had to place the foundations of the earth in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in order for the earth to stand through all the pain of sin. The reason that this fact is mentioned in Revelation 13 verse 8, is because Satan's attack through the Antichrist in Great Tribulation is his strongest attack ever against the world. However, because the earth's foundation is in the Lamb's blood, it will not be shaken, even though the Antichrist overcomes the saints, has power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth worship him, Revelation 13 verses 7 to 8. This shows the indescribably awesome power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to overcome all that that the world and Satan throws against it. Revelation 13 verse 10, Since it is given unto the Antichrist to make war with the saints, Revelation 13 verse 7, Apostate Israel, who has joined themselves with the Antichrist, will come against the believing remnant of Israel to take over Jerusalem. Therefore, apostate Israel will end up taking believers into captivity and killing some of them. That is why Revelation 6 verse 9 shows souls slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, in Matthew 26 verse 52, Jesus told Peter to put away his sword, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Therefore, when apostate Israel comes against the believing remnant of Israel with weapons, the believing remnant is told by God not to fight. After all, if the power to overcome them is given to the Antichrist, Revelation 13 verse 7, fighting will not do any good. To stand and do nothing, while the enemy comes to kill you, takes a great amount of faith in God's plan to deliver your soul from death, and give you a new body at the end of the tribulation period. Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10 verse 28. Dot. The patience comes in waiting for this deliverance for the believing remnant taken captive by apostate Israel, since they continue to be persecuted for their faith through the great tribulation. Revelation 13 verse 11, from Revelation 19 verse 20, we know that this other beast is the false prophet. He looks like a lamb, but he speaks as a dragon. So, he looks like the Messiah, while he speaks the words of the devil. A prophet says, Thus saith the Lord. Therefore, the false prophet will say that he speaks for the Lord, but he is really speaking the words of the devil. Revelation 13 verse 12, Since the false prophet is able to exercise the power of the Antichrist, 
he causes the world to worship the Antichrist. Thus we see that Satan creates a false trinity. Satan resurrects the Antichrist and gives him power and authority, Revelation 13 verses 1 to 2. The false prophet does great wonders and miracles to testify of the Antichrist, Revelation 13 verses 13 to 14. We see the false trinity work together in Revelation 16 verses 13 to 14. They are an imitation of the Holy Trinity. God the Father resurrected the Lord Jesus Christ and gives him power and authority, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24 to 28. The Holy Ghost then came along and testified of Jesus Christ, John 15 verse 26, and performed miracles during Acts 1 to 7. Thus, what Satan does during the Great Tribulation is to copy what the Trinity does at the at-hand phase of the kingdom. He does so because he was defeated in heavenly places, Colossians 2 verse 15, 12 colon 7 dash 9. Therefore, Satan thinks he can get the earth for himself if he copies on earth what God did to gain the heaven for himself. Thus, Satan is anti-God, the Antichrist is Antichrist, and the false prophet is the anti-Holy Ghost. Revelation 13 verses 13 to 14 The way that the false prophet convinces the world to worship the Antichrist is by doing great wonders and miracles. This makes the world think that the greatness he has ascribed to the Antichrist must be true because of the supernatural power that he has. In other words, the Antichrist must be the Messiah, and Satan must be God, or else the God, who raptured up the body of Christ, would use his power to keep the false prophet from performing great wonders and miracles. God will stop this unholy trinity, but not yet. The wonder of making fire come down from heaven will be especially convincing because, 1. Men will reason that the false prophet must be from God since fire comes down from heaven, where God lives, and 2. Elijah, a true prophet of Israel, called fire down from God in heaven to consume a sacrifice, 1 Kings 18 verse 38. The reaction back then was that the Lord is the God, 1 Kings 18 verse 39. Therefore, when unbelievers see the false prophet do the same, they will come to the false conclusion that Satan is the God. However, the test, during the tribulation period, is not who calls fire down from heaven, but it is who says that Jesus is the Christ, 1 John 4 verses 1 to 3, the Son of God, 1 John 4 verse 15. Note also that the false prophet does these miracles in the sight of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 14. Thus, the Antichrist approves of the false prophet. This is important to note because the false prophet tells the world to make an image to the beast, Revelation 13 verse 14. If the Antichrist was truly the Christ, he would not allow this to happen because the second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, Exodus 20 verse 4. Therefore, although the Antichrist and the false prophet are extremely deceptive, causing people to believe that Satan is God, if Israel will compare what they say and do with what God says in his law covenant with them, it will be clear that they represent Satan. Therefore, Israel has no excuse on Judgment Day if they do not put their faith in God and His law covenant with them and reject the Antichrist. Now in Genesis 11, we read of the Babylonian religious system that resulted in the world trying to build a worship tower to Satan in rebellion to God. This worship system has never gone away, such that we still see it in the tribulation period as the religion of the Antichrist. Revelation 17 verse 5 calls it a mystery, because it is hidden within churchianity. It serves the creature, rather than the creator, Romans 1 verse 25. As such, its symbol is a supernatural woman. In Jeremiah 44 verses 17 to 19, she is called the Queen of Heaven. She is also called Ashtaroth in Judges 2 verse 13, Easter in Acts 12 verse 4, and Diana in Acts 19 verses 27 to 28. Today, Catholicism has taken Jesus' mother, Mary, made her into a perpetual virgin, and deified her, such that she is worshipped more than the Lord Jesus Christ is, making her today's Queen of Heaven. In fact, the Catholic Church has officially dubbed her the Queen of Heaven. There are apparitions of Mary that are seen from time to time, in different parts of the world. These apparitions or images are probably all similar. This is Satan's way of getting the world to accept the image of the beast already. Therefore, the image of the beast is of the Queen of Heaven, which is the focal worship point of the Babylonian religious system from Genesis 11 to today, 
and this image will probably look a lot like the image of Mary found in Catholic churches all over the world today. This worldwide acceptance of the image today makes it easy to have such a worldwide acceptance for the Great Tribulation. So, we see from Revelation 13 verses 13 to 14, that the false prophet performs wonders and miracles to deceive the world into following the Antichrist. He also has the power to get the world to make an image of the Queen of Heaven. Note that it does not say that the image is of the beast. Rather, the image is T.O. the beast. The idol of the Antichrist's darling mother is a gift from the world to the Antichrist in appreciation of his being willing to die and rise from the dead in order to do away with those evil two witnesses mentioned in Revelation 11 and supposedly bring in God's kingdom. At least, that will be the world's take on it. Note also that Revelation 13 verse 14 tells us that the way that the Antichrist died was by a sword wound to the head. Revelation 13 verse 15 once the image, T.O. Revelation 13 verse 14, the beast is accepted by the beast, it becomes his image, such that it is now the image of Revelation 13 verse 15, the beast, meaning that it belongs to him, since he accepted it as a gift from the world for saving them from God, whom they think of as the evil one. Now, the false prophet uses his power to give life unto the Queen of Heaven. Mary, or the Queen of Heaven, now has the power to do two things, one, speak, and two, cause those not worshipping her to be killed. Perhaps the image is artificial intelligence, or the false prophet supernaturally brings life to it. Either way, an image having power gives even more credence to people worshipping it, because it is not some lifeless statue. Thus, we see that the false prophet sets up the full-blown Babylonian religious system. Since this system is much like the current, Catholic system, except with much more power to it, the false prophet will probably end up being the Pope of the Catholic Church. Like the Antichrist, he was also probably killed for trying to kill the two witnesses, and Satan will resurrect him as a beast, just like he does with the Antichrist. Thus, the world will have its Christ, the Antichrist, who is probably Judas Iscariot, since they are both called, the son of perdition, John 17 verse 12, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, its Holy Ghost, the false prophet, who is the Pope and Mary of the image of the beast, all resurrected from the dead and all testifying that the Antichrist is the Christ so that the world will look to them and obey them, rather than obeying God's law covenant with Israel. The world will obey them because they walk by sight, not by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Note that, while Judas Iscariot and the Pope are actually resurrected from the dead, Mary is not. That is because the real Mary is a saint of God, Acts 1 verse 14. Therefore, Satan has to have an image made of her, that can talk, instead of an actual, live, human being. However, this is all still very convincing evidence that Satan is God, such that except those days should be shortened to three, and a half years, there should no flesh be saved, Matthew 24 verse 22. Note that the false prophet is the one, who actually institutes the death penalty for not worshipping the image of the beast. By the way, the image of the beast, being set up in the temple, signals the beginning of the last three, and a half years of the tribulation period. It is called the abomination that mocketh desolate, in Daniel 11 verse 31 and 12 11. It is an abomination because it exalts itself against God and is in the temple. It makes Jerusalem desolate of all those, who will be saved, because they flee to the mountains in order to keep from being killed by the Antichrist, Matthew 24 verse 16. Thus, it is the abomination that mocketh desolate. We should note that the false prophet institutes the death penalty for those who will not bow down to the image of the beast. This shows that Satan tries to get people's allegiance through negative reinforcement. By contrast, God only gets people's allegiance to him through positive reinforcement. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 verse 8. God loves us so much that he sent Christ to die in our place, while Satan hates us so much that he threatens to kill anyone who tries to accept God's love. Revelation 13 verses 16 to 17, the false prophet also causes all to receive the mark of the beast. Today, if you ask churchianity what you have to do in order to be killed by the Antichrist, most will say that you will be killed only for taking the mark of the beast. That is a lie of Satan to get people to take the mark. The Antichrist will only kill those who do not worship the image, Revelation 13 verse 15. 
Those not taking the mark will not be killed. They just will not be able to buy any food or participate in the Antichrist's economic system, Revelation 13 verses 16 to 17. Satan will use the lie planted in people's heads to get them to take the mark. When they see people taking the mark they will reason, this is not the mark of the beast because no one is killed for not taking it. This is just a way to prevent identity theft from happening so that I can spend my money. Therefore, I will go along with this. Another reason that they will conclude this is because of another lie of Satan that most people believe, which is that the mark of the beast is 666. 666 is the number of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 18, it is not the mark of the beast. Since the beast is like unto a leopard, Revelation 13 verse 2, the beast's mark is a leopard spot. Just like Satan has already set up images of the Queen of Heaven in Catholic churches, he already has set up the mark of the beast in those same churches. The mark of the beast is a leopard spot that goes in the forehead, Revelation 13 verse 16, and that is what Catholics already receive on Ash Wednesday, a mark in their forehead like a leopard spot. It is also similar to what married Hindu women already have, what Jewish people have with their phylacteries, and what faithful Muslims have with their prayer bumps. Therefore, when the mark of the beast is instituted, people will already be familiar with it from their religion, and will see it as having the added benefit of protecting them from identity theft so that they can spend their money. In other words, most will think that the mark is God's way of protecting their money. They will not see it as the mark of the beast, since it will not have the number 666. Therefore, the world will line up in droves to take the mark. They also will have no problem worshipping the image, since it seems to be verified by God, because they think the Antichrist is God. Also, people will not know that God has reserved the lake of fire for those, who worship the image, as well, because churchianity does not teach that. Worshipping the beast, worshipping the image of the beast, and taking the mark of the beast, are all punished by God by throwing the offenders into the eternal lake of fire, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. The below chart illustrates why people will not heed the warning of Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. Antichrist's Punishment Man's Belief God's Punishment Man's Conclusion Worshipping the Image Death, Flesh God is okay. Death, soul. Worship the image. Take the mark. No food, flesh. This is not the mark. Death, soul. Take the mark. Therefore, man's result is eternal death in the lake of fire. Therefore, it is by the whole world believing Satan's lie program that the false prophet will be able to cause all people to receive the mark of the beast. The Pope is probably the false prophet. So, the world will think God is behind the mark and the worship of the image, since it will look a lot like what Catholics already practice. They will reason that God raised the Pope from the dead in order to accomplish God's purpose. Therefore, they will believe whatever the false prophet says over what the word of God says, especially since the false prophet mocketh fire come down from heaven and perfumeth miracles, Revelation 13 verses 13 to 14. People, today, already believe their pastors over the word of God, and he does not perform miracles. The false prophet also brings life to the image of the Virgin Mary, Revelation 13 verse 15. This is on top of all the Antichrist does. The Antichrist is seen as the Christ because Satan raised him from the dead, and the Antichrist killed the two witnesses. This, alone, is enough for the world to worship him, Revelation 13 verse 4, and any hint of doubt is removed by the false prophet, testifying that the Antichrist is the Christ. Although the Antichrist is an Assyrian Jew, Isaiah 10 verses 5 to 12, we see him instituting the Babylonian or Catholic religious system. Another sign of this is his vow of celibacy. Daniel 11 verse 37 says that he does not regard the desire of women. Therefore, he remains pure through his vow of celibacy. This makes him the true Christ in the Pope's eyes, because the Catholic hierarchy requires their priests to be celibate. Revelation 13 verse 17 says that, in addition to the mark, some people will actually take on the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
This is yet another deception by Satan. Some people have a completely rebellious attitude and will take 666 in their foreheads just to prove that God will not kill them for taking the mark. God told Adam that in the day he ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die Genesis 2 verse 17. Satan said, Ye shall not surely die Genesis 3 verse 4. Adam ate. His soul died instantly, but he did not die physically on that day. It is the spiritual death that God was referring to. Similarly, Satan will say that those taking the mark of the beast will not die. Some will take the 666 mark in defiance of God. They will die spiritually, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11, but they will not die physically right away. This will give doubters the confidence to have the leopard's mark placed in their forehead. Thus, we see that Satan works all angles to convince the world to worship the image and take his mark. The higher-ups will take 666, or the name of the beast in their foreheads. This will, supposedly, show their real allegiance to God, and the Antichrist will give them more power as a result. Seeing apostate Israel with the mark of the beast, the Antichrist having power over the whole world, the Pope performing miracles, the image of Mary speaking, and the economic prosperity of the whole system, will cause the entire world to worship the image of Mary and take the leopard's mark in their foreheads. Note that Revelation 13 verse 16 says that the false prophet's edict applies to all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Therefore, most people will take the mark. 144,000 were sealed by God, midway through the tribulation period. The great tribulation serves to bring in all, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 6, so all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11 verse 26. Therefore, we know that more Jews will be saved during the Great Tribulation period. How many? We do not know. There were about 600,000 men that God led out of Egypt, Numbers 1 45-46. It was about the same amount that entered the Promised Land 40 years later under Joshua, Numbers 26 51. With women and children, this number was probably around 2 million. Therefore it makes sense that Jesus, Jesus is the Greek word for the Hebrew Joshua, would lead two million Jews into the millennial kingdom. This would include all saved Israel from Genesis 12 through Acts 7 and Hebrews through Revelation. So perhaps another 56,000 are saved during the Great Tribulation, bringing the tribulation total to 200,000, which would be 10% of the entire number of Jews coming into the kingdom. Regardless of how many are saved, it is a small percentage, since Satan's deception through his false religious system of Babylon will be so great that except those days should be shortened, there should not flesh be saved, Matthew 24 verse 22. Also, note that the Antichrist's punishment for not taking the mark of the beast is that they will not be able to buy or sell, Revelation 13 verse 17. This is why Jesus said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, Matthew 19 verse 24. Yes, Jesus meant that literally. In other words, in order for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, he must love God more than his possessions, because he will have to give up his possessions to save his soul. This is also why Jesus told the little flock to sell that ye have, Luke 12 verse 33. We see believers obeying this command in early Acts, Acts 2 verses 44 to 45, for colon 30 for dash 35. In other words, since they will not be able to participate in the Antichrist's economic system during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, they might as well sell what they have and use it while they can. This is in stark contrast to today's body of Christ, who are told, but if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. Most of churchianity is thoroughly confused and preachers take verses out of context to their material advantage, due to a failure to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Instead, we need to recognize that Matthew early Acts applies to Israel during the at-hand phase of the kingdom, and only Paul's epistles Romans Philemon directly apply to us today, so that we are not tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, Ephesians 4 verse 14. Revelation 13 verse 18, 
666 is not a bad number. 6 is the number of a man, since man was created on the sixth day, Genesis 1 verses 26 to 31. 3 is the number of completeness, since the Godhead is comprised of three in one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Therefore, three sixes, or 666, is the number of the height of man. It is man at his worst. We see a type of this with Solomon in 1 Kings 10 verse 14, when he received exactly 666 talents of gold as tribute each year. The beast represents the height of men to such an extent that the number of his name is 666. Note that the world will not associate the number 666 with the beast. You have to have wisdom and understanding in order to count the number of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 18, to determine that it is 666. If Gematria, a Jewish system of assigning letters to numbers, is used, 666 equals Isis, which is another name for the Queen of Heaven. Therefore, the Antichrist's name is related to his mother, the Queen of Heaven, aka Isis, and it takes wisdom to calculate that the Queen of Heaven's number is 666. This is yet another deception by Satan to get people to worship the image and take his mark. In other words, people will not readily associate 666 with the mark of the beast, because they will not use wisdom to calculate the number associated with the name of the beast. Therefore, they will think that they will be okay if they have the leopard's mark placed in their foreheads, not having any idea that the mark of the beast is not 666, and not knowing that the number of the beast's name is 666. In other words, most people will not associate 666 with the mark or with the beast, therefore, they will take the mark without any check of their conscience to prevent it. Also note that, in creating the mark, Satan is imitating God again. Satan set up the false religious system of Babylon. In the Great Tribulation period, Satan has a false trinity to imitate God. Now he imitates God again, by creating an eternal security plan for those who take the mark. In other words, if he can get people to take the mark, there is absolutely nothing they can say or do to receive eternal life. They are guaranteed to spend eternity in the lake of fire, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11, much like God gives guaranteed eternal life today to all those who recognize their sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, Romans 5 verses 9 to 11, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14.